Okay, welcome to this video where we're going to be having a look at some common Paper 1 questions and topics that do tend to come up on Paper 1 exams. Now you've got to remember even when you're using a checklist like this, you're not able to go through and just cross things off and say that definitely won't come up on a non-calculator paper. So because of that, I do think the Paper 1 tends to be the hardest just because you have to revise everything. As you can have a look at this, you can see and you can probably look at topics and think there's a low probability that that topic will come up on a non-calculator paper, but we don't want to write anything off. Even things like the quadratic formula, you could be asked to plug numbers into the quadratic formula and write your answer in third form. So there are lots of topics that, you, that are less likely to come up on paper one, but we're not going to disinclude anything. But during this, we are going to look at the more popular topics that tend to come up across paper one exams. We have got an awful lot to get through, so we are going to get started and hopefully you make it to the end. But if you don't, and I hope you do, best of luck in your exams. Okay, so this question says three fifths of a number is 48, work out the number. So this really tends to confuse people when it does come up because obviously when you see three fifths of a, of a number, a lot of people are gonna think, okay, straight away, divide by the bottom times by the top. But this is actually in reverse. This is saying that three fifths of a number is already 48. And if we think about this in terms of our bar again, let's just think about if we had split this up into five portions this time because it is in terms of fifths, there we go. So if I split this up into five parts, which I may not get perfect, there we go, good enough. And it's what it's saying is that three of them has already been calculated as 48. And we want to know what the entire original number is. So looking at this then, okay, well, if only three of them were 48, well, we wouldn't divide by five anymore. But instead, we would divide by three because we want to know how much is going to go into each of those three boxes just above. So this time, and it's obviously the complete reverse of before, because this time we're going to divide by that numerator. So instead we're going to divide it by 3. And that's going to tell us what number goes into each of the bars above. So 48 divided by 3 is equal to 16. And again, you can put that, obviously, the working out just to the side. So if I put now 16 into each of these bars, I would also put it into those additional two, because we are looking at now all five of them. So that number there, if we add up all of those 16s, and again, you can obviously add them all up, or you can do 16 multiplied by five. So that working out, I would do to the side, 16 times five, because there are five boxes, and that adds up to 80. There we go, and that is my answer. And again, you could put the 80 next to your diagram if you prefer to use a diagram method, but that is how we're gonna go about approaching these questions. So if you think about what we've actually done, it's just the complete opposite of what we did before, and that's why it's in reverse. This time, instead, we are dividing by the numerator and multiplying by the denominator. But you need to understand why, and I think that this visual idea really does help you to understand why we would divide this time by the numerator and why previously we were dividing by the denominator. So for the first one, we've got work out three and four fifths, add three sevenths, and give your answer as a mixed number in its simplest form. Now, when we're looking at this sort of question here, uh, one thing that we need to remember, no matter which type of calculation we're doing, adding, subtracting, dividing, or multiplying, if we have mixed numbers involved, we need to make them top heavy first. Now, when it comes to adding and subtracting, there is a little bit of a different approach that you can take that some of you may use, but I'm gonna use the same method for all of these types of questions, and that is making any mixed numbers top heavy fractions first, or, okay, or improper fractions first. So the process for doing that is obviously taking our fraction here, three and four fifths, we want to turn that into an amount of fifths. So to do that, we want to figure out how many fifths are in three. So we can do three times five, which is 15. Add the extra four fifths there, and that makes 19 fifths. So three and four fifths, three times five is 15. Add the four that we've got there as well is 19 fifths. Okay, so it's the big number times the bottom to make 15, add the top number on the fraction there, 19, so we've got 19 fifths. And we're gonna add that to the three sevenths. 
Now when it comes to adding and subtracting, we need to have a common denominator. So we need that number on the bottom to be exactly the same. Now that means that we can multiply both fractions here, as long as we should do whatever we do to the bottom, we also do to the top, we can make equivalent fractions with a common denominator. So thinking about five and seven, the lowest common multiple of those is 35. So in order to get them to be 35, the left fraction there, I can times the top and bottom by seven, and the right fraction, we can times the top and bottom by five, and that would give us 35 on the bottom of both. So we've still got to work out 19 times seven there, and obviously take your time doing so, but 19 times seven is 133, and at the moment that is going to be over now. 35. Okay, so you get some quite big numbers here, but obviously don't be afraid just to the side to do some multiplication there. Added this 7 times 10 and, uh, and 7 times 9 and added them both together, okay, but you can show you're working out to the side. On the right fraction there, we're going to times them both by 5, so 3 becomes 15 and 7 becomes 35. And now we're in a position where we can add these both together. So we can just add together the numerators 133 plus 15, which gives us 148. And that is over 35, remembering that you don't add together the denominators. There we go, we've got 148 thirty-fifths. Now obviously it says here to give your answer as a mixed number in its simplest form. So it's up to you whether you try and simplify this or whether you uh, so obviously turn it into a mixed number first. But we need to turn it back into a mixed number, so to do that I need to know how many times does 35 go into 148. That's not the nicest, so I'm just going to write down a few of the 35 times table. So 35, add another 35 is 70. Add another 35 is 105, add another 35 is 140, and then it's not going to go beyond 140 there, because obviously we, our number there is only 148. So uh, to go from here, um, we know that that 35 goes in four times, so that's going to be a big four. And what's left over from 140 to 148 is an additional eight thirty-fifths. There we go, so four and eight thirty-fifths left over. Okay, so looking at that number there, you've just got to decide as well, does that little fraction at the end there simplify? Does 8 over 35 simplify? Now in the case of this fraction here, it actually doesn't. There's nothing that goes into both 8 and 35 other than 1, and obviously that's not going to simplify it for us. So that actually is fully simplified there. So even though it says give it in its simplest form, in this circumstance here, that little fraction on the end there doesn't simplify. Okay, but it's going to say that anyway, because we didn't have to use 35 as our denominator. We could have potentially used a bigger number like 70 or even larger if we wanted, but because we used the lowest common multiple, it's just ended up that that did, doesn't actually simplify at the end there. But do look out for that because that fraction quite often does need simplifying, okay? But there's our final answer, 4 and 8 over 35. Right, okay, so dividing with mixed numbers to start with, it says so, work this out, 1 and 1 fifth divided by 3 quarters, give your answer as a mixed number in its simplest form. So again, let's make these top heavy, so 1 and 1 fifth is 6 fifths, big times the bottom is 5, add the 1 is 6, so I'm going to divide that by three quarters, okay? Now normal fraction rules apply here when we are dividing fractions. We keep the first one as it is, we're gonna flip the second one over, do the reciprocal of that second one, and then we're gonna multiply the fractions instead. And multiplying fractions is probably one of the easiest little bit of math you ever have to do, because we, you know, exactly what we'd like to happen happens, we just multiply the top, multiply the bottom. So in fact, rather than doing six fifths and doing a divide, I'm just gonna times it by the reciprocal, which is four over three, literally just flipping it over. And then from there, we just multiply the top numbers, so 6 times 4 is 24, and 5 times 3 is 15, and there we go, we get our final answer. Now obviously it says to give your answer as a mixed number in its simplest form, so I do want to have a look at creating a mixed number or simplifying it first, okay, it's up to you which one you go. I'm going to uh, turn it into a mixed number first, so we get 15 goes into 24 once, so we have 1, and the remainder there is 9 from 15 to 24, so we have 9 over 15 left over. Now this is the first time this has come up, look, because that mixed number there, okay, this little fraction with it does actually simplify, they both divide by 3, and I would need to simplify this now, okay, so that would end up being 1, and if I divide the top and bottom by 3, 9 divided by 3 is 3, and 15 divided by 3 is 5, so my final answer is 1 and 3 fifths, okay, so you just got to spot and watch out for that, okay, but there is something else you could have done, you could have taken a slightly different approach there, you could have actually simplified at this point, the top and bottom both divide by 3 and you get 8 fifths when you do that, and then you could turn it into a mixed number from there, so 5 goes into 8 once, with a remainder of 3, and you get 1 and 3 fifths, 
So it's completely up to you which method that you prefer to use, whether you turn it into a mixed number first and simplify the fraction, or whether you simplify the fraction and then turn it into a mixed number, it's completely up to you. Okay, but just obviously remembering that when you divide, you keep the first one and you multiply by the reciprocal, okay? And a lot of people remember that, like keep, flip, change, okay? You keep the first, flip the second, and change the sign into a times. And obviously when we're multiplying fractions, that's really nice and easy. So it says write 0.47 with the recurring dot above the seven as a fraction in its simplest form. Now when it comes to this, we are gonna use a bit of algebra to do so. Now the first thing we're always gonna do is just write that x equals the decimal in the question, 0.47. With the recurring dot. And it's important just to think about what's actually recurring here, and it's just the seven. If I was to write it out as an actual decimal, it'd be 0 0.4, and then I could just keep writing sevens forever. Okay, now when there's only a one recurring decimal, the thing that we can do here is if we can take this value of x, which is 0 0.47, we can just multiply that by 10. And depending on how many recurring decimals there are, will determine what we can, what we actually want to multiply it by. And you'll see the reason that we actually do this. So if we multiply it by ten, we would get four point seven, and then it'd be another seven as it's recurring. And I'm not going to write any more sevens. I'm just going to write the same amount of decimal places as I have in my one above there. Two decimal places in 0.47. So I'll keep two decimal places in this version here. Now the reason this can help us is now we can take these away from each other. And if we do take them away from each other, those seven, those recurring sevens are going to cancel out. So I want to take them away, and it can seem a little bit odd doing this because I'm doing the bigger number on the bottom take away the smaller number on the top. So you can always feel free to realign it to the side, which I can do over here. I won't actually normally do this, but 4.77 take away 0.47. Okay, so I tend to do it just looking at it up sort of upside down on the side, but you can actually just realign it. Look, the seven take away the seven makes zero, the seven take away the four makes three, and then four take away zero is four, so it's 4.3. So when we take these away from each other, 10x take away the one x leaves us with nine x, and then our decimals, when we take them away, we get 4.3, and I'll, I won't write the zero after that, I'm just gonna write 4.3. Now there are other methods of doing this, this is just the way that I like to do it, I always just like to remember one recurring decimal, multiply it by 10 and then take them away from each other. But you end up with this scenario here, look where we have a decimal on the right hand side, we've got 4.3. Now I can't turn this into a fraction, or I could, but we shouldn't really have decimals in a fraction. So before I turn it into a fraction, I'm going to multiply both sides by 10. So once we've multiplied both sides by 10, we get 90x and that equals 43. And now we can turn that into a fraction. We've got 90 in front of the x, so we can divide both sides by 90. And it's important to leave this in terms of algebra because some of these questions will say prove. So I'm just going to keep it as x equals. So x equals 43 divided by 90 or over 90. There we go. Now we've almost finished. It does say give it in its simplest form. Now you've got to think, Do these? Uh, does this fraction actually simplify? Okay, so there are different ways of actually doing recurring decimals and sometimes you might not get it in its simplest form. Now the way that I have done it does actually leave this fraction here in its simplest form. Okay, 43 over 90 doesn't simplify. It is worth just having a check though, just to you know, let's try and apply some little tricks. Are they both even? Do they both divide by two? Do they divide by three or five? And keep just checking a few numbers that you know go into 90. Uh, and, but as, of, as the way I've done this particular question, it has actually finalised in its simplest form. Okay, so that one doesn't actually need simplifying, but just make sure you check in those final steps to see if it simplifies. Okay, 525 is a product of prime factors. So with these slightly harder numbers, we're going to try and tr to apply some number tricks here. So let's have a look. What does that divide by? Now, things that I'm spotting it ends in a 5, so it definitely divides by 5. And it ends in this 25, so it does also divide by 25. Now I'm going to just stop to divide by 5, because I can do that quite easily over to the side. And don't be afraid to do some working out for these. So 5's into 5 goes once, 5's into 2 doesn't go, so carry that over. 5's into 25 goes 5 times. So 525, is a little split there, is 5 times 105. And again, 105 ends in 5, so we can do the same again. You might be able to do some of them in your head, but I'm just going to show you, obviously, that you have, do have these methods available. 5 doesn't go into 1. 5 goes into 10 twice. And 5 goes into 5 once. So 105 is 5 times 21. Now we're at a point here where hopefully we spot that 21 is 3 times 7. And there we go. We've finished off our tree. So we've got 5, 5, 3, and 7. So 3 times 5 times 5 times 7. And then putting these two fives as 5 squared. So 3 times 5 squared 
times 7. So this first one, we've got 25 to the power of negative a half. Now when it comes to these powers, we just need to remember what each piece does. So if we make some notes on this, the negative part of the power, as we've seen before, does the reciprocal. It flips it over, so it flips it over. The number on the bottom, underneath, underneath that line there, which I like to refer to as ground level, the number underneath does the root. So in the case of a two, that would be a square root, and if it was a three, it'd be a cube root, and so on. And the number on the top is just a normal power. So these are the three things that we have to look at when we have these combinations going on. And sometimes we might not have a number on the bottom, sometimes we might not have a negative, but if we have them all, we have to think about all three of these pieces. So it doesn't matter what order you do it in. Now, I tend to always go for this number on the bottom first, purely because it's easier to do the root of a number than it is to then do the, uh, to, than it is to do the normal power when the number's quite large. If we imagine there was a normal power of two on the top, it'd be a lot easier for us to square root this than it would be to do, say, 25 squared first. So I always do the number on the bottom first, that's just personal preference, although you can do it in any order that you like. So what I've got to do here, first of all, I'm gonna deal with this number on the bottom. So I'm gonna go for this root first. So if I do the square root of 25, we get the answer five. So that's the root dealt with. Now I'm gonna move on to the other piece. So I've got the flip going on, or the reciprocal. So if I flip five over, remembering five is five over one, if we flip that over, it becomes one over five. Now the normal power there is just a one, and a normal power of one Let's find a different colour, I've used quite a lot now. A normal power of one doesn't actually change anything. Anything to the power of one is just itself. So that one over five there would be my final answer. Let's have a look at another one though where that normal power on the top is something different to one. Okay, here we go. So write down the value of eight over 27 to the power of two thirds. So we've got eight over 27 and our power there is two thirds. So again, no negative in this one, so we're not gonna have to flip it, but we do need to deal with these two numbers. So on the bottom I have a three, which is a root, and that is a three there, so that's a cube root. And on the top we have our normal power of two, which is gonna to be to square the numbers. All right, so again, just like before, you can do this in whatever order you like. I'm gonna stick with the root to start with. So I need to do the cube root of both these numbers. And it's a bit of a hint in the numbers in that they're both cube numbers. So the better you know your square and your cube numbers, the easier this becomes. So the cube root of eight is two, and the cube root of 27 is three. So we're at two thirds at this point. Now the next thing I'm gonna to have to deal with is this square. So we need to square both of them. So two squared and three squared, and two squared is four, and three squared is nine. So my final answer there is four over nine. And I can leave my answer just like that, it doesn't simplify. So that is absolutely fine as a final answer. So moving on to this one. Write the square root of 80 in the form k root five, where k is an integer. Now, the square root of 80 is a good one because there are a few square numbers that go into the square root of 80, so let's have a look. 1, 4, 4 goes in, 9, 16, 25, 36. And this is where you've got to be really, really careful with thirds. So we know that 4 goes in, but we do have to make sure and just check, is there a bigger square number that actually goes into 80? And it's not a very nice one to spot with the square root of 80, but 16 actually does go into 80. It goes in five times. So the other way that I can write the square root of 80 is I can write the square root of 16 times the square root of five, just like we did before. And again, the square root of 16 now actually becomes the whole number four. So it's four times the square root of five. And again, just getting rid of that time sign. We can say four root five, there we go. Finishing off our question. Now, I think it's quite important to talk about this at this point because if we only spotted that the four went in. At this point, we might have written the square root of 80 as the square root of four times the square root of 20. And we may have gotten to the point here where we wrote two times the square root of 20 and then simplified down that to two root 20, okay? But unfortunately at this point, root 20 is not as simple, it's not as small as it can actually go. Um, so this would actually be wrong and we'd have to continue simplifying it. I'm going to move on to another question here where we look at what to do in this scenario where there is a number in front of, this, of a third that can be simplified, okay? But 4 root 5 is our final answer there. Okay, so we've got the square root of 40 plus the square root of 90. And again, I like to link this back to algebra. If we think about something in algebra like 
3x add 4y. Okay, hopefully we know that we can't actually add those together, we just leave it as it is. But if we have something like 3x add 4x, they can actually combine and they can make 7x. Okay, and the reason they can add together is because they have this common letter here, the x. Now we're gonna take the same approach when it comes to thirds. If we can have the same number here underneath the third, underneath the square root, okay, then we can actually add them together. Now at the moment it's a 40 and a 90, so they don't add together. But let's have a look. Let's see if we can do anything and simplify this down. Let's get rid of all that. Okay, so at the square root of 40, let's have a look at that to start with. That is the square root of 4 times the square root of 10. And again, remember, just write them down, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25. We'll see if we can write enough down to start with. Right, so the square root of 40. Square root of 4 times the square root of 10. Well, that looks like a 6. Let's get rid of that. Square root of 10. There we go. So that is two lots of the square root of 10, root 4 being 2. So 2 root 10. Okay, so if root 90 can also have a root 10, we can add these together. So let's have a look. Root 90 is the square root of 9 times the square root of 10. Lovely, so we've got that root 10 going on there. Lovely, the square root of 9 is 3, so it's 3 lots of root 10, or 3 root 10. Perfect, so we've got 2 lots of root 10 and another 3 lots of root 10 getting combined together, and 2 plus 3 is 5, so we have 5 lots of root 10 in total. Perfect, so we can add those together because we had that 10 underneath the square root for both of them. Okay, so writing some numbers in standard form, we're gonna make this a number between one and 10, times 10 to the power of however many jumps we have to do in whatever particular direction. So this number here, 5,600, I'm gonna hop the decimal uh, in between the five and the six. So one, two, three. So that becomes 5.6 times 10 to the power of, it's a big number there, it's not a naught point number, so 10 to the power of three final answer. The next one is a small number, so we're going to have a negative power, because we hopped the decimal the other way this time, so 1, 2, 3 would make it 3.4, and again this time it would be times 10 to the negative 3, because it's a naught point number, that indicates that it's a small number. When it comes to the other way around, writing them as ordinary numbers, I like to rewrite this little bit at the start to start with, so 2 and 3, and I like to just imagine where that decimal is between the 2 and the 3. So times 10 to the power of 5 makes it a big number, so we need to hop it 5 places, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to the right, and then filling in all those zeros underneath, and if it is messy just remember to rewrite that, but there's my answer, 230,000. The next one, 8.04 times 10 to the negative 3, so this is going to be a naught point number, and again I'm just going to write these digits out at the start, these bits here, and imagine where the decimal is at the top, 8.04, so negative 3 means it's going to be a small number, so we're going to jump it left 3, 1, 1, 2, 3, so it's going to go there, fill in all the zeros and tidy it up at the start. So 0.00804, final answer. Okay, so looking at this one, four times 10 to the five times three times 10 to the minus two. And there's an example of one where we probably won't want to write this out as ordinary numbers and work them out because it might get a little bit over complicated here. But let's look at applying that same little trick. So let's do the four times the three, which gives us 12. And that's going to be times 10 to the power of something. I'm just going to be a little bit careful here because although we can add these powers, let's just have a look because one of them's a negative. So the powers, if I write this to the side, we're going to do 5, the first power, and we're going to add the next power, which is negative 2. And 5 plus negative 2 is 5 take away 2, so my power there is going to be 3. So that's fine, 12 times 10 to the power of 3. And again, we just need to put this in standard form because this 12 is not between 1 and 10. So instead we'll make that one jump smaller, we'll make it 1.2, and to balance that out we'll make the power one jump bigger, so three goes up to four. And there's our final answer, 1.2 times 10 to the four. Same process again. We've got three divided by six though. So let's do this to the side. Three divided by six, let's write that as a fraction. Three divided by six, if we simplify that, goes down to one half. So to keep this as a number rather than a fraction, I'm gonna write that as 0 0.5. So over here we have 0 0.5, of 3 divided by 6, and then we've got that times 10 to the power of, and again, subtracting the powers on these. So we've got 3 take away a negative 2 on the second one, and 3 take away negative 2 turns into a plus. So we have 3 plus 2, which gives us a power of 5 for this one. So we have 0 0.5 times 10 to the power of 5.
And again, we can balance this out because it needs to be in standard form, but this time, to make 0 0.5 between 1 and 10, we make it one place value bigger to make it 5. And if we make the number bigger, the opposite this time for the power, we make the power smaller. So 5 drops down to a 4. So 5 times 10 to the 4. So a similar process, but here we had to make the number bigger, so we made the power smaller. OK, here we go. So we've got some x squared pieces and some x pieces. Now, I know all the pieces are x in, these x squared pieces we're going to treat separate to the just the x pieces on their own. So if I just have a look at the x squared pieces, we've got a 12x squared and we've got a minus 3x squared. So 12 lots of x squared, take away 3 lots of x squared, leaves us with 9 lots of x squared. And I'm just going to leave that piece separate to the x parts. So looking at the next one, we've got 5x, take away 2x, and just like we did before, 5 lots of x, take away 2 lots of x, leaves us with 3 lots of x, and that's positive 3 lots of x, so plus 3x. And there we go, we'd leave it just like that. We can't join up an x squared and an x piece, they stay separate. OK, so we'll expand and simplify this. Now we've got this minus 2 in the middle here, so we just need to be careful. But let's just treat it in exactly the same way. We'll times the first bracket by 3 to start with. So 3 times 2x gives us 6x. And 3 times negative 4 gives us negative 12. Now let's have a look at that second bracket. So we have a negative 2 at the start here, so we're just going to have to remember to times by negative 2. So negative 2 times x is negative 2x. And negative 2 times positive 5 gives us negative 10. OK, so the symbol's not just getting copied there, it is getting affected by that negative 2 at the start. So be very, very careful with this negative 10 here uh, when you're doing these. Right, so collecting it all together, we've got 6x take away the 2x, and that leaves us with 4x's. And we've got negative 12 and a negative 10 here, and negative 12 take away 10 is negative 22. And there's that expanded and simplified. OK, so we've got another algebraic fraction here that has already been factorised on the bottom. So actually, let's have a think about how we'd approach this. Now, we want to cancel off a common bracket or a common factor, and the top and the bottom both divide by x plus 2. So actually, if we imagine what this would look like if we were to sort of expand that bracket or just write it as a double bracket, we'd have x plus 2 on the top. On the bottom, it's x plus 2 and x plus 2 as a double bracket. There we go. Right, so if we cancel off one of the x plus 2's top and bottom, we've just got to be careful this time because we can cancel that one off and it will disappear. But not to forget, we are dividing by x plus 2, so when we cancel the one off the top, it doesn't just disappear, but if we divide it by x plus 2, it becomes 1. So writing our final answer, we would have 1 on the top and x plus 2 on the bottom, which again, I'll just get rid of the bracket there. So 1 over x plus 2. So just watch out with these sorts of questions here when the factor is all that there is on the top. Obviously, that does become a 1 there. It doesn't just disappear. And let's have a look at one more before you have a go. OK, so in this question, we've got a slightly harder quadratic on the top and a different sort of quadratic on the bottom. So on the bottom there, hopefully you recognise that it's a difference of two squares. When there's no x piece in the middle there, it's because the numbers are the same and they've cancelled each other out. So if I start with the bottom, I just think it's the easier one there. The factors of 16 that are the same are 4 and 4. So our difference of two squares there is x plus 4 and x minus 4. There we go, and that's that factorised on the bottom. That gives us a little helpful hint for the one on the top there, which is slightly harder, because our factors of 4 are 1 and 4, or 2 and 2. Now, because we've got the little hint here that we, you know, we know we're going to have a 4 if it's going to simplify, we know it's going to be the 1 and the 4, but now we just need to have a look and figure out which way it goes around. So... We've got 3x in one bracket and an x in another. That'll allow us to get the 3x squared. Again, obviously, check out my video on factorising these quadratics or harder quadratics if you're unsure on these. But in order to make 11 there, we're going to want the 4 to get multiplied by 3 to make 12. So we want plus 4. That'll make positive 12. And we want to take away 1, so we'll put the minus 1 over here in the other bracket. And again, now we've got it factorised, it's nice and easy for us to cancel off these x plus 4s and just write what we've got left. On the top, we've got 3x minus 1. And on the bottom, we've got x minus 4. And there we go. That is our fraction there, fully simplified. OK, so this says simplify this fully. So we've got 8 over x plus 3, add 3 over x plus 8. Now what we need is a common denominator when we're adding fractions, just like we're adding normal fractions. So I'm going to multiply the right fraction by the left denominator. So I'm going to times the top and the bottom by x plus 3, which I'm going to write in a bracket there. It's going to help when I actually multiply it. So times the top and the bottom by x plus 3. And then I'm also going to times the right by the le uh, sorry the left by the right denominator. So I'm going to times the left by x plus eight, and also on the top, timesing that by x plus eight, just like with normal fractions here. So if we times the top there by x plus eight, we actually get a single bracket. We get eight lots of 
x plus 8 there we go over and we've got a double bracket on the bottom we've got x plus 3 that's also getting multiplied by x plus 8 and we are adding to that three lots of x plus 3 and on the bottom we've got that double bracket x plus 3 x plus 8 there we go x plus 3 x plus 8 Right, so if we go back actually expanding these numerators and we can join it all together, so 8 times x and 8 times 8, and that gives us 8x plus 64. And on our other one, we've got 3 times x, which is 3x, and 3 times 3, which is 9. There we go. And we're going to add these fractions together. So let's rewrite these denominators in. We've got x plus 3x plus 8. And another one, x plus 3, x plus 8. There we go. And we're adding these together. Right, so if we add them together, we've got the 8x add the 3x, which makes 11x. And we've got the 64 add the 9, which makes 53. So 11x plus 53, all over that denominator, which we can expand or we can leave it in brackets. If you do want to expand it, x times x is x squared, times 8x and 3x, so we've got 11x. And 8 times 3 is 24, so plus 24. Although you can actually leave the bottom there factorised as x plus 3, x plus 8. But we'll expand it out and leave that as our final answer there. So we have 11x plus 53 all over x squared plus 11x plus 24. Okay, so this question here, we've got quite a lot going on. We've got one fraction divided by another and it says simplify it fully. Now if we have a look what we've got to do, um, we know when we're dividing fractions we have to keep the first one and times it by the reciprocal, so flipping the second one over. So we can just write that out straight away if we want. I'm just going to factorise any in the process though, so I'm just going to do that to the side well, here before we actually write anything down. So that factorises by 3 and that would leave you with x plus 2. The bottom there doesn't factorise, so that'll stay as it is, so we can write this out now. So we've got 3 lots of x plus 2 all over x minus 4. We're going to times that by the flip version, but let's see if we can factorise them first. So the bottom here is quite a nice one, factorises by x, and we get x minus 4. So that's going to now be on the top when we flip it over. So we have x brackets x minus 4. And this one here, we're going to have to factorise this as well. So we've got 1 and 10, or 2 and 5. Let's have a look. Now one of them is going to be a 2x, because it's 2x squared. And 1's an x. Right, so let's write these down. We've got 1 and 10, or 2 and 5, and we're trying to make 9. So let's have a think. We could double the 2. There we are, that works. So double the 2, so 2 in the other bracket, plus 2, that would make 4. And plus 5 over here, and 4 plus 5 would make 9. So we can put that on the bottom now. So we've got 2x plus 5, and x plus 2. There we go. Now if you think about what we'd have to do here with timesing fractions, if we times fractions, we just times the top times the bottom. So essentially, everything there on the top is going to be on the top of our fraction, and everything on the bottoms of those two fractions are going to be everything on the bottom. So what we can do at this point, we can actually cross-cancel some of these. And if you have a look, we've got an x plus 2 there, and an x plus 2 here. Because obviously if we, if we actually did multiply these together, one would be on the top, one would be on the bottom, so we can cross-cancel them before doing so. So they're gone. We can also cancel this x minus 4, uh, so that's gone as well. Obviously on the bottom there, that's the only thing there, so that will turn into a 1. And everything else has something with it. So if we times together what we've got on the top now, we've got a 3 and an x on the top of those two fractions, so 3 times x is 3x. And on the bottom there, we've got 1 multiplied by 2x plus 5, so that's just 2x plus 5. There we go. So that simplifies all the way down to that. Okay, so obviously just have a look. When you're doing one of these dividing fractions or any of these algebraic fractions, look to factorise anything you can and just follow normal fraction rules. So here we factorised everything and then times it by the reciprocal, flipping it over and just cross cancelled any common brackets there before multiplying them together just to save us having to write it out and then cancel them off. Okay, so we've got these worded questions here, and you might recognise some of these questions as well in terms of the style um, that you might have seen these come up in little exams or little tests that you've done. So we've got Amy has some sweets. 
Bethany has twice as many sweets as Amy, and Charlie has five more sweets than Bethany. In total, they have 55 sweets. How many sweets does Charlie have? And at first, these sort of worded questions can seem a little bit confusing. It might seem that you have to just apply a bit of logic or guess some numbers, but there's a nice way that we can do this by forming and solving an equation. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to allocate the letter, and we may as well use the letter X as we've been using that for the rest, but we could use any letter if we wanted. We're going to allocate the letter X to one of these people. So we have Amy, and I'm just going to write these to the side. We have Amy, we have Bethany, and we have Charlie. Now, if we look at our statement here, one of these people we haven't been told anything about. So it says Amy has some sweets. It says Bethany has twice as many as Amy. So we've been told something about Bethany. She's got twice as many as Amy. And we've been told that Charlie has five more sweets than Bethany. So we've been told something about Charlie as well. But the person that we haven't been told anything about there is Amy. Okay, Amy's kind of like our little odd one out there. We've not been told anything about her. So if we look at Amy, and we're going to just give her that letter, we'll call her X. Okay, we don't know how many sweets Amy has, but we know how many sweets everyone else has in relation to Amy. So if we look at that first line, it says Bethany has twice as many as Amy. So if Bethany has twice as many, she has basically double what Bethany has, so we could call Bethany 2X. Okay, and 2X just means 2 times X. Whatever Amy has, 2X would double it. So there we go, there's our expression for Bethany. Now if we look at Charlie, it says Charlie has five more sweets than Bethany. So Charlie has five more sweets, exactly five more, than what Bethany has. Now Bethany's was 2x. So we're not going to times it by five, it's just five extra sweets. So Charlie is going to be Bethany's 2x plus an extra five. Okay, obviously if it had five sweets less than Bethany, we'd have 2x minus five, but it's five sweets more than Bethany. So there we go, we've got 2x plus five. Right, so we've got our three expressions for each person, and now we can actually have a look at forming our equation. Just as a little side note, obviously some of these descriptions could be given to you slightly differently. We could have been told that Charlie or somebody had five more than Amy, and then so-and-so had twice as many as that person, and that would just mean doing it in a slightly different order. For example, I mean, if, if it said Charlie had five more than Amy, then Charlie would instead be x plus five. It might then say that Bethany had twice as many as Charlie, and I realise I'm saying quite a lot of different words here, but then we would have to double the x plus five. So we could have these in different orders, but this is just one type of example um, and one type of question. So obviously what we need to do is now think about how we're going to form our equation. We've got the expressions for each person, and now it says in total they have 55 sweets. Or in, in other words, if we add together all these expressions, they are going to add up to 55. So if we add them all together, we've got x, 2x and 2x, that's 5x, and we've got the plus 5, so we've got 5x plus 5. And that is going to be equal to the 55 sweets. So if we write our equation then, so 5x plus 5 has to equal 55, and then we can just go ahead and solve that. So take away the 5 from both sides, we have 5x equals 50, and then we can divide by 5, and we get x equals 10. And then we can use that x equals 10 to find out how many sweets they all have. And we can just use it based on the expressions that we've got over there. We now know that Amy is x, so Amy's got 10. Bethany has double that, so Bethany's going to have 20. And Charlie has 5 more than Bethany, so Charlie will have 25. And just double check in there, they all add up to 55, and they do. So in terms of this question, how many sweets does Charlie have? Charlie has the 25 that we've got just there. Right, there we go. So... That's how to go about some of these questions. Um, and I think it's good for this question here, although we could have just substituted 10 into Charlie's expression then, and two times 10 plus five, I always think it's good just to find out how many all of them have or whatever the question's about, and then just pick the one that you need for this particular question. So as it's asked about Charlie, obviously we only need to give the 25 there as our answer. Okay, so this inequality here, we've got six x plus one is greater than or equal to two x plus 11. So obviously we've got an x on both sides here, and I'm gonna treat that just like when we have equations with x's on both sides, I'm gonna eliminate the small smallest x from both sides to start with. So the smallest value of x is that 2x there. So I'm going to minus 2x from both sides, which is going to get rid of it on the right. And it's going to reduce this 6x on the left here. So I'm just going to write my working out. I'm just going to write minus 2x here from both sides. And let's see what we end up with. So 6x drops down to 4x. We've still got the plus 1. 
and that is now greater than or equal to positive 11, so I won't put the plus in. If it, obviously, if that was a minus there, I'd have to put that in, but there's no need for me to put plus 11 there. Now we can go about taking away the one from both sides. Okay, so just like on the, on the previous question, we'll get rid of the one, we wanna to get to it, so it says x is bigger than or equal to. So we're gonna have four x now is bigger than or equal to 10. And then we need to divide both sides by four. And obviously that's gonna leave us with a decimal here because 10 doesn't actually divide by four perfectly. So if you have a calculator, you can type that in. But if you don't, let's have a look. Let's do this to the right here. We're gonna have x is bigger than or equal to, and I'm just gonna write it as a fraction, 10 divided by four. There we go. So 10 over four. Now, obviously if you've got a calculator, you can just type that in, but if you don't, we just need to actually uh, simplify that as a fraction. So if we divide the top and bottom by two, we get five over two, and that's always quite nice. Five divided by two is 2.5. So we've got X is greater than or equal to 2.5, okay? Just remember, obviously, that's nice and easy to simplify. Five over two, two goes in twice with a remainder of one, so it's two and a half, or 2.5. So that's not the nicest to draw on this number line because it's going to be hard for me to get perfectly on 2.5, but I'm just going to do my best. I'm going to put it in the middle of 2 and 3, and this time it's greater than, so I'm going to point it to the right. doesn't matter how long the arrow is there. And obviously, look, we've got our extra ink on the inequality there, so it can also be equal to that number. So I'm just going to colour that circle in. There we go, and that just shows that it's a greater than or equal to. The extra ink on the arrow, extra ink in the circle. And there we go, that's just uh, obviously how we do that if we've got x on both sides, we just treat it in the same way. Hopefully you notice just by looking at it, when it says x squared minus 2x equals 15, this question here doesn't equal 0, or it doesn't equal 0 yet. So before we can actually factorise this and solve it, we need to move that 15 to the other side. That's easy enough, we just have to subtract 15 from both sides, and that will give us equals 0 on the right there. And if we do that, and I'll slot the 15 right at the end, we get x squared minus 2x minus 15 is equal to zero. There we go. And it's worth noting at this point as well, to be fair, that 2x could have been put on the other side. It could have been 15 plus 2x over here, and we had to subtract the 2x as well. Now, for the purpose of obviously this question, we're just going to have a look at obviously a nice simple one. But to be fair, we could put as many pieces as we want on the right-hand side. It always needs rearranging to make it equal zero. But we'll get rid of that, obviously, because the 2x was on the left. And now we can just go about factorizing it and solving it as normal. So for 15, we can have one and 15, or three and five, and there are only options for this one. And we're trying to make negative two there, so we're gonna to have to use three and five. So we'll want positive three, take away five, and that'll give us negative two in the middle there. So if we put that into a double bracket, we get x, and what do we say, positive three, and x negative five, or x take away five. There we go, that's equal to zero. Always leave that equal zero in there. Don't forget it is an equation that we're solving, so we don't just wanna get rid of that. And then we can get our two solutions. I'm just gonna apply the little trick this time. It's plus three in the bracket. So that's gonna to flip to negative three. So x equals negative three. And for the second one there, we have negative five in the bracket. And again, if we flip the sign for that, we get x equals positive five. And there we go, there's our two solutions. X is negative three and X is positive five. And again, just very briefly, in terms of what the graph would look like there, it would go through a negative and a positive solution. I'm not gonna do it to scale, but it would look something like that that would allow it to go through a negative over here at minus three and a positive over here at five. And that's all that we're actually working out. That's what we're solving, these two solutions here. I'm just thinking about what the graph would look like. So I've got a couple of questions for you to have a go at. Obviously, the main priority here is actually getting to these solutions. X is negative 3, X is 5. But if you want to do a little bit of an extension on top of that, you could always think about drawing the quadratic curve as well and actually thinking about what it would look like. And I think that's a nice little extension for this topic as well. Okay, so find the equation of the tangent to the circle with equation x squared plus y squared equals 5 at the point 1, 2. Now, you don't have to have a picture for this. It can sometimes just help just to visualise it, to just draw a little sketch. They're all centred at 0, 0. So we can just draw a little sketch. doesn't matter if it's any good or not. 1, 2 will be in this quadrant here. And then we can draw part of the tangent there, and we can just label it up. So 1, 2, obviously centre 0, 0. There we go, and we can use that to try and help us visualize this. So we are gonna find the gradient of this radius here, which we can do by drawing a little right angle triangle in. So the rise goes from naught up to two, and the run goes from naught to one. So we can just use that to find our gradient now. So the change in y over the change in x is two over one. There we go, that's quite a nice one, because that's just two. 
So our perpendicular gradient doing our negative reciprocal of two, remembering again that two is just two over one, so it becomes one over two, and swapping to a negative. So there's our gradient. And again, from here, it's pretty much the same steps as on the previous video there. So let's just have a look. We've got y equals minus a half x plus c, and then our coordinate is one, two. And if we sub that in, let's see what we get. We get two equals minus a half times one, which is just minus a half, so I won't bother writing that in, plus c. Add the half over, we get two and a half, equals c and that's fine to leave it as a mixed number and now we can just write our equation just replacing c with two and a half so y equals minus a half x plus two and a half and again you can write these as decimals if you want you could write minus 0.5 x plus 2.5 okay likewise you could even write two and a half as five over two you can leave it as a top happy fraction if you want or in proper fraction absolutely fine for you to do as you can see that one there was a little bit nicer than the last one okay so just showing you that they're not all that nasty um, still obviously a difficult topic but that's a nicer version of one of these questions okay so our first question we are starting with a quadratic now we know that a graph is a quadratic if it has a little squared in it so this particular graph has x squared and this is quite a nice one it's just x squared take away four now normally you're asked to complete a table and then also draw the graph now the my main priority for this video is going to be on actually getting these tables completed I like to hope that we can all draw these graphs once we've got the coordinates so I'm not going to stress too much about the actual drawing here in fact the actual graphs that I've got on the screen are quite small and mine aren't going to be perfect but I'm just going to give you the general idea of how to go about drawing all these graphs here so for this one here we've got y is equal to x squared take away 4 now that obviously means just to find the y coordinate we square the x coordinate and then take away 4 so it's quite hopefully quite nice and simple we're gonna have a look at a trickier one after this where you just got to be careful with how you actually go about doing this so it says uh, for all the values of x from negative 3 to 3 now if it doesn't give you that information you can find them along the x-axis here if you have a look the x values stretch along from negative 3 along to 3 there so that's where we get them if it doesn't tell us okay or if we're not given a table but for all of these I am going to give you a table now obviously we are starting with this one on the left so we've got negative 3 there and we need to sub that into our equation so to find y I'm just going to write the working out we would do x squared so negative 3 squared and we've got to be very careful when we're writing negative 3 squared because particularly if this is a calculator question if you type that into the calculator you are going to get the answer negative 9 because what the calculator does is it squares the 3 and then puts the minus with it it doesn't actually do negative 3 squared so a really important little thing that you need to remember throughout this is that we're just going to put all our numbers in brackets like that okay so we're going to write not minus 3 in brackets squared and then we're going to take away 4 of course if this is non-calculator we can work that out anyway because we can do 3 squared negative 3 squared which is positive 9 so we've got 9 take away 4 and that gives us the answer 5 so we know that, that number there is going to be 5 we can then move on to the 0 and again I'm not going to write all the working out down for every single one here but we would just do 0 squared again we'll put the 0 in brackets although it doesn't matter if the number is not negative and then take away 4 and 0 squared take away 4 is minus 4 so we can just put minus 4 straight in there and the rest and this next one here I'm going to do without writing the working out down we've got 1 squared which is 1 take away 4 which is negative 3 now it's not that easy to spot but obviously when it comes to straight line equations there's always quite a nice pattern in the table when it comes to quadratics it's not the nicest of patterns okay and the others aren't going to follow a pattern but there is actually a bit of a pattern in a quadratic if you have a look we've got minus 4 in the middle and either side of that we've got negative 3 either side of that we've got 0 and either side of them we've got 5 so there is a bit of a pattern although I certainly wouldn't rely on these because they don't stay there throughout all of the graphs and sometimes it's very difficult to spot some of these patterns but just thinking about the fact that there is a bit of a pattern we'll be looking at these so let's have a look then actually plotting this on the graph now we've got an x and a y coordinate there that little bit there x is negative 3 y is 5 so that's the coordinate minus 3 5 now I'm going to plot these quite quickly minus 3 5 is somewhere up here I'm not going to be able to do them perfectly on the screen here now we've got negative 2 0 we've got negative 1 to negative 3 obviously getting your x and y coordinates the right way around here 0 to negative 4 and then it repeats the pattern going up the other side there. So we've got one and negative three, we've got two and zero, and we've got three and five, which is 
somewhere up there. Right, so in terms of actually drawing the graph here, we've plotted the points. We now need to get a nice smooth curve that goes through all of the points. So not with a ruler, a nice smooth curve, and it has to go through every single point. So I doubt I'm gonna get this perfect. We're gonna give it my best shot. I'm just gonna do a nice smooth curve. Ooh, no little kinks in it. I actually can't see them as I'm doing them. There we go. So I've done it as best as I can, but you want to get yours nice and smooth. Okay, so make sure you do it with a pencil. Rub it out if you have any um, any kinks like I've got down the bottom there, but then you can go back and have a go and actually rub it out and just make sure you get a nice smooth curve there. Right, so that's what a quadratic graph looks like. We're going to have a look at a slightly harder one. Uh, before we move on, there are, there are a couple of things to know about this quadratic graph and a couple of the points that are important. We're not going to look at them specifically in this video, but there are two places which are, well technically three but there are two things that are quite important with a quadratic graph one of them is this point right here at the bottom where it sort of goes starts stops going down and starts going up that can be called a couple of different things it's got a specific coordinate there it's zero minus four it can be called the turning point there we go or it could be called the minimum point or the maximum point if it's uh, sloping another way so the minimum point or turning point there we go, the turning or the minimum point, that's a very key place on a quadratic graph. And there's also two other points here, which is where it crosses the x-axis. So we've got these two points there, which is negative 2 and 2. Let's just write that in there, minus 2 and 2. And these have a special name as well. They've got two names again, they can be called the roots. There we go. Or they can be called the solutions. There we go roots or solutions. So we're not going to focus on those points in this particular video, but obviously just a couple of extra little bits to be thinking about there, the roots and the solutions where it crosses through the x-axis and the turning or minimum point down the bottom. Obviously just adding a little bit of context to the language there, the turning or the minimum point seems like quite an obvious place, so you would just give that as a coordinate, 0, 4. But then the roots, okay, doesn't always necessarily have a bit of a, a logic there, but I do like to think of this x-axis uh, as being ground level. And when you think about plants and things like that where they meet the ground is where the root starts so I do like to think of these sort of things as like the little roots there and that's sort of where the word comes from uh, but you've also got the word solutions so there's no not really any context there but it's just where it meets the x-axis there okay so what we're gonna have a look at is some equations of lines where it isn't in the form y equals mx plus c so whenever we're looking at lines we need it to be in this form here now it can be written in other forms we can use them perfectly fine but in order to compare them and in order to find out the gradient it needs to be in this form here so looking at this question it says here are the equations of four straight lines two of the lines are perpendicular which two now if we look at this first one it's not in the form y equals mx plus c Okay, it has a 2 in front of the y, so in order to get it into the form y equals mx plus c, we're going to have to divide everything by 2. Okay, so I'm just going to write divide by 2, and we've got to divide both sides by 2. So 2y divided by 2 gives us 1y. We've got 1x there. 1 divided by 2 is a half, so that 1x would become a half x. And the 1 divided by 2 at the end would become a half, so that's plus a half. There you go, half x plus a half. So there's my first one. Let's have a look at the next one. Now this doesn't have anything in front of the y, but it does need rearranging. Look, the x there is on the left-hand side of the equal sign. So if we add a plus 2x to both sides, we would get y equals, and just to keep it so that the x part's here, although I don't have to, I'm going to stick it in front of the 4. So y equals positive 2x. So as it's in front of the 4, I don't have to put the plus sign. And there we go, we get 2x. And then we do have to introduce the plus sign for the 4 there. So plus 4 as it is positive 4. There we go, 2x plus 4. And that's my second one. Let's have a look at the third one. What we're going to do for this one. Okay, so we've got a 3 in front of the y. So we need to divide everything by 3 so that it says y equals. Don't have to rearrange it at all, but dividing everything by 3. So dividing that by 3, we get y equals. 6 divided by 3 is 2. So 2x, so that's 6x divided by 3 is 2x. And then add 5, and 5 divided by 3, let's leave that as a fraction, 5 over 3. That just means 5 divided by 3 there, rather than trying to actually work that out. So 5 over 3 is fine, as we are also looking at the gradients here to decide which two are perpendicular, because that's what we're going to have a look at, which ones are perpendicular. We don't really need to worry about the y-intercept there, okay? But there we go, let's have a look at this last one. Okay, so... Uh, nothing in front of the y, but the 2x is in the way here, so we need to minus 2x from both sides to get that out of the way. And again, just like before, I'm going to put it in front of the 3. 
So y equals, we're subtracting 2x, so minus 2x. There we go, and then that is positive 3 again, so plus 3. Right, so we need to have a look at which ones of these are perpendicular. Now, as we've got, and let's see if we can highlight this, we've got a 2x and a 2x here. So those two lines there are parallel. Not asking for which ones are parallel, but they have the same gradient, so we could say that those two are parallel. So let's have a look at the other two. So we've got these two here. So the gradient of the one at the top, so the gradient of A is a half, and the gradient of D down the bottom there is negative two. And if we think about this, how do oh, if I if if half is my gradient, my negative reciprocal would be negative two, wouldn't it? You'd flip it over; it'd be negative two over one, which is negative two. So therefore, those two lines must be perpendicular. Okay, so it's just something to be thinking about in terms of different line equations, what they can look like, and the way we want to have them. We want to have them as y equals. We don't want any numbers in front of the y. If we do, we're going to divide it. And we, if there's anything next to the y, we just want to move it over to the other side. Okay, but the a and d there are my two lines that are perpendicular. But we're going to be having a look at some line equations next, where they might not necessarily already be in the form y equals mx plus c, and that just hints to you that you do, do have to change them first. Okay, so this question says Carol runs a race. The graph shows her speed in meters per second t seconds after the start of the race calculate an estimate for the gradient at t equals 4 and explain what your answer represents now obviously this type of question we already know now what the answer represents if we find where t equals 4 which is just here there we go we obviously know that once we work out that gradient that is going to show her acceleration so let's just write that in straight away that shows her acceleration All right, there we go. So let's work out the acceleration at that point or the gradient at that point. So t equals four, again, this is not the nicest for me to draw here, but I'm gonna do it as best as I can. All right, there we go. To be honest, actually looking at that, I'm not gonna keep drawing this over and over again, but I'm not actually very happy with the fact that there's quite a big gap here and there's not really much of a gap on the right-hand side there. So to be honest, if I had this on paper right now with a ruler and a pencil, I'd be rubbing that out and doing it again. But as we're just running through the process here and having a little practice, I'm gonna leave it as it is. I'm just gonna go ahead with it and see what we get. But obviously, if you are following along with me on the paper with this, uh, obviously try and make yours a little bit more accurate than mine there. Now it looks like I've got quite a nice triangle that I can draw in. I'm going to go across from here to here and again. You can do this however you like. You can make it whatever size you like. You just need to read accurately. But I've just gone along from 3 to 6 there. And I'm going to go up. And I look like I get some quite nice numbers here. So this, I'm going to stick with this. Now the run there goes from 3, which is just here where the start of that orange line is, along to 6. So that is a run of 3. And it goes at a height from 7 up to 10. If anything, maybe it's just over 10, but 7 to 10, there we go, that gives me a height of 3 as well. There we go. So in this case, I've got a rise over run, I've got a change in y over change in x, I've got 3 divided by 3, 3 over 3, and that gives me an answer of 1. There you go, meter per second squared. Right, there we go. So there is an answer for this one here. Now I'm just gonna do that one more time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this quite quick. I'm gonna see if I get the same answer. There we go, because obviously I don't think it was super accurate. So I'm gonna have one more go. So let's have another look. Okay, let's just draw as best as I can. That is even worse than the last one. Let's have a go at one more time. Okay, maybe one more. There we go, I'm a lot more happy with that one. Let's see if this works. Very difficult to do without a ruler. But there we go, let's have a look. So let's go across. I'm gonna make it a little bit smaller, my triangle this time. I'm gonna go from here to here. And then I'm gonna go up. There we go. So my run there goes from four to six. So that is a run of two. And my rise there goes from eight to 10.2 by the looks of it. So that is a rise of 2.2. .2. Right, there we go. So in that, for that working out there, for the second time I've done it, my rise is 2.2, .2, my run is 2, so 2.2 .2 divided by 2 gives me 1.1 metres per second squared. And there we go. So we've got a slightly different answer there, so you can see how obviously just changing the gradient slightly is going to slightly change your answer. But these sorts of exam questions, you are going to have an allowed amount of uh, range there, so it's going to be somewhere between 1 and 1.2 or something like that. Okay, but obviously you just want to do this as best as you can. Make sure you show you're working out. Make sure you draw your tangent in nice and clear. Make sure you show where you've got your numbers. Make sure you show your rise over run. Write down change in y over change in x. Show those numbers. 
Okay, and then even if your tangent isn't great, you're not going to lose you're not going to lose more than one mark on a question like this. But obviously, just a, a little bit of practice getting those tangents perfect. Okay, so here's quite a different question. It says the diagram shows a pattern made by two regular polygons. Work out how many sides tile A has. And what's not very nice about this one is it doesn't show you um, all of the sides here. Obviously, that's why it's asking us how many sides it has. It just shows us part of tile A, and then we've got the equilateral triangle there. So have a go at this one. See if you can work it out. I'm going to go over the answer, but see what you get. See if you can figure out how to apply some of the methods we went over in that first um, that first slide there and see if you can get the answer. So pause the video, have a go, and we'll go over the answer in a sec. Okay, so looking at this question then. Now first things first, let's have a look at the angles around this point right here. Now we know in the equilateral triangle that's an angle of 60 degrees. And if tile A is the same on both sides, then um, what we can do is take that 60 away from 360 and split it in half. So if we do that, so 360, take away the 60 degrees in the triangle, leaves us with 300. And if we divide that by two, we've got 150 degrees in each of these tile A's here. So 150 degrees and 150 degrees. So what the question's now asking us is what polygon, or how many sides does a polygon have to have to have that interior angle of 150 degrees when it's a regular polygon? So two different ways we could do this. Now we could just guess. I could just say, okay, well, let's just guess 14 sides. And then if it is 14 sides, I'll take away two times it by 180, divide by 14 and see if it matches. And if it's too high, I'll go, I'll go lower. And if it's too low, I'll just go higher with my sides. Okay, but we can take a little bit of a, an easier approach here. Now, if you remember on that first one, when we looked at the polygon, if it had an interior angle of 150, we could have a look at what the exterior angle is. And because it's on a straight line, the exterior angle would be 30 degrees. So if you think about this, if you remember that all the exterior angles add up to 360, well if one of them's 30, obviously 150 and 30 make 180, then I could just say, all right, well, if I do my 360 and I divide it by the exterior angle there, which is 30, that gives me a total of 12. There we go. And that tells me that there must be 12 angles around the polygon, because obviously that 30 fits in 12 times. So there we go. Working that out then, we've got 12 sides, as our final answer. And again, you can check that. If I was to do um, 12 take away with two, that'd be 10 times 180, and then divide it by 12, and you get the answer 150. So you can always check that out. Okay, so this question here is not a right angled triangle. It is a type of triangle, though it's an isosceles, and that is shown to you via these two lines here, drawn on those two lengths. Obviously, if we had another one on the bottom, it would be an equilateral, but you can already see it's not an equilateral as the side lengths are different. But this is an isosceles triangle, meaning both of those diagonal lengths there are both 17, matching this one just here. Now, again, with a triangle like this, we are just going to use the same formula, and that is that the area is equal to half base times height. There we go, which again, you could write in a different way if you prefer. You can write down base times height, or BH, divided by two. So for this one here then, we just need to identify the base and the height. The base is 16, and as you can see, the height is 15. So for this particular one, we're gonna need to do 16 times 15, and again, ignoring that diagonal length. So if we write that down, we've got to do 15 times 16. Now obviously that's probably not one that you're going to do in your head, but you could obviously just write your working out to the side. Now the answer for that comes out as 240, and we need to actually halve that. So 240, if we divide that by two, gives us an area of 120. And again, we would write that with centimeters squared, so it's 120 centimeters squared. Now, particularly when you've got larger numbers like this, you could save some time by using the first formula, and that is to halve the base before you multiply it by the height. So instead of doing 15 times 16 and dividing by 2, we could have just halved the 16 and done 8 times 15 instead, and, in, and that as well would give us 120 straight away, and we wouldn't need to halve the answer. So up to you which method you use, either one is fine, but that is how you work out the area of a triangle. You do the base times the height and divide it by two, or you just do half times the base and then times that by the height. Okay, so when we're looking at the area of a sector, and particularly when we're doing it in terms of pi, some of these questions can be easier, sometimes they can be slightly harder, but this one is sort of in the middle. So it says here that the diagram shows a sector of a circle radius seven. Work out the area of the sector and give your answer in terms of pi. So all we're gonna do is do the working out as we would when we were using a calculator, but we're just not gonna actually type it in. 
So to start with, we need to know our area formula. So the area of a circle is pi r squared. When we are looking at a sector, we also multiply it by the fraction that we're looking at, which I'll call theta over 360. So in this case, the angle is 40 degrees and the radius is 7. So if we plug that into our formula there, we have pi multiplied by 7 squared multiplied by 40 over 360. Now we obviously want to simplify this a little bit so we, get, so we can get a bit of a simpler answer that we can give in terms of pi. The first thing that I probably simplify is the 7 squared. So that's going to be pi times 49, which you can write as 49 pi. And then we're going to multiply that by this fraction. I want to simplify that as well. So if I do that to the side, 40 over 360. For starters, you could divide them both by 10, which would give you 4 over 36. Then, of course, both divide by 4, so that become 1 over 9. So we're going to times that by 1 over 9. Now, the easiest way to go about this is to just simplify those numbers. So 49 times a ninth just means 49 divided by 9. Now, that doesn't actually simplify, it doesn't divide perfectly, so that would just be the fraction 49 over 9. So I'd just say that this is 49 over 9, and put the pi symbol after it, and that would be my answer there in terms of pi. Of course, if they did divide, you could simplify that fraction further, giving it as a whole number, but of course, as it doesn't, and we're writing it in terms of pi, it's fine for us to leave it just as it is in a fraction. Let's work out the total surface area of the cuboid. Now, when it comes to a cuboid and we're working out the surface area, we need to remember we are going to work out the area of each individual surface. And when it comes to some of these shapes, you can't always see each of those surfaces. Now, if we think about what we can see, we can see that we have the face on the front. And the same face that's on the front, which I've labelled number one, is also on the back. So we're going to have two of those rectangles there for those two surfaces. If we also think about what else we have, we also have the shape here on the right, which is another rectangle. And that is also going to be on the left-hand side of the cuboid as well, even though we can't see that one. And for the final shape that we have, we have the rectangle that's shown on the top, and that is face number three, and that is the same as the face on the bottom. So when it comes to a cuboid, we actually have two of each face. And when it comes to a cuboid, we also need to know how to work out the area of a rectangle, as all of these faces are just rectangles. So when we're looking at each one, we just need to identify the side lengths for each individual rectangle, work out their areas, and then we'll combine them all at the end. So if we start with face number one, if we have a look, the width and length in either order is 8 and 10. So to work out that area, we would just do 8 times 10, and that would give us an area of 80, and we will worry about the units at the very end. Now again, that is the same as number 1, so number 1 is also 80, so we can label that for both of them. We're going to then move on to another rectangle, and as I've already labelled it, number 2, we'll start with that green one. So if we look at that one there, the length of that rectangle down the bottom is 5, now the actual width or the height of this cuboid we can get from the other side and that is a height of 8. So we have a height of 8 centimetres. So to work out that area there we would do 5 times 8. So just make sure that you get those lengths from wherever you need them. So if I write that down that is going to be 8 times 5 which is going to be 40. And that is another one of our areas. Again we can label that with our other side which is also 40. And on to our final one, we've got the rectangle on the top and the bottom. Now again, we're going to have to label both of these, but if we look at the top, we have the area, and let's just get rid of that, we've got 5 down the bottom, and the other, area, oh, the other length is 10 just down here. So if we label that up near our rectangle, this is 10, and this is 5, so to work out the area of number 3, we would do 5 times 10, and that is equal to 50. And again, that is the same as the one down the bottom, which is also 50. So again, you might have noticed that in all of these multiplications that we've done to work out in each individual area, each one has a different pair of numbers because all of the lengths on the cuboid were different numbers. So for the, top, for the middle one there, the front face, we had 8 times 10. For the side, we had 8 times 5. And then for the top, we had 5 times 10. So it's up to you in terms of which process that you do. When it comes to a cuboid, what you can do is just work out the area of each individual face, the three that we worked out. You can add them all together and then double your answer. Or you can obviously work out all of the individual faces, even though there are matching pairs, and then add them all together. 
So completely up to you, but if we go ahead and add them together now, we have 80 and 80. We then also have our green face that we worked out, which is 40 and 40. And then our final two, we have 50 and 50. And all we need to do is add all of those together. So let's add them all up. So we've got 80 plus 80, which is 160 plus 40 gets us to 200, plus the other 40 gets us to 240, and then we've got an extra 100 there, which is 340 in total. And now we wanna give our units, it was in centimeters, and we're looking at an area, so it's centimeters squared. So our final answer for this question would be 340 centimeters squared. Now when it comes to a cuboid and we're working out the volume, what a lot of people will do is they'll just multiply all the sides together. And that is absolutely fine, that will work, but it doesn't really help with the understanding of how to move through all the different shapes. So what's important to note is that when we work out the volume of a shape, we work out the area of what's called the cross section, and then we multiply it by the depth or however far that goes through the shape. And in regards to a cuboid, the cross section can actually be any of the faces. Now all that the cross section is, it's just one of the faces that goes or extends all the way through the shape. Now in regards to the cuboid here, as it's the one facing us, I'm gonna look at this one as the cross section. And if you kind of imagine slicing it, if it was you know something that you were able to slice, down the middle, that cross section would stay constant all the way through the shape here going in this direction, which in this case will be the depth. But as I said, when it comes to a cuboid, to be fair, you could actually look at any of the faces as the cross section. Take the right hand side, for example, this one here, we could actually slice it down that way and that face would also go through the shape in this direction if I kind of try and draw that in, okay? But as it stands, I'm just gonna have a look at the front face there and we're gonna use that as the cross section. Now, as that is a square, Sometimes, most of the time, that's gonna be a rectangle, but in this particular one here, they're both 20. To work out the area of that cross section right there, when it's a rectangle or a square, we just do the length times the width. So the first thing we work out is 20 times 20, which is 400. Obviously, that's an area there, so our units would be centimeters squared, but we're not gonna worry about the units until the final step here when we work out the volume. Now, the next part of that process is obviously to multiply that by the depth. And in this case, the depth, how far it goes back, this distance here, is 40 centimetres. So all we're gonna to do to finish this off, to get our volume, is we're gonna take the 400, the area of the cross section, and multiply it by the depth, which in this case is 40, and that gives us 16,000, and that'll be centimetres cubed. Okay, not forgetting that when we have volume, our units there are gonna be cubed. Or potentially when we're looking at liquids, we might have something like liters or milliliters. So that is how you work out the volume of a cuboid. Okay, so this question says a rectangular frame is made from five straight pieces of metal. Work out the total length of the metal needed. Now in order to do this, you can obviously see that the rectangle around the outside, we have 12 on the bottom and five on this side. So they're gonna be matched up on the other sides. This will be five and this will be 12. We just need to find that diagonal length. Now obviously that means we're going to have to use Pythagoras as we're finding a missing length in a right angled triangle and we've got the other two lengths. And obviously Pythagoras can appear in lots of different formats. This is quite a nice one though, so if we find this we can do, and we're finding the longest length, so we're going to square the sides and add them together. So we've got 5 squared, add 12 squared, and that is 25 plus 144, which is a total of 169. Now when you are doing Pythagoras, regardless of whether you're finding the longest side or the shortest side, you want to square root your answer. And if we square root 169, it's not one of the most commonly known ones to be done without a calculator, but the square root of 169 is 13. So that's going to come out as 13, and of course we're looking at metres with this particular question. So that's going to be 13 metres, and of course this was 5 and 12. So now we all, all we actually have to do is add them together, up to you how you add them. I'm going to add the two 12s to start with, which is a total of 24. Then I'm going to add the two 5s, which is a total of 10, just to make it a bit quicker to do the addition. And then we're going to add the 13 into that, and just add them all up. So 4 and 3 is 7, and then 2, 3, 4, so we get 47 metres in total, and that would be the total length needed to make this particular frame. So there we go, a little bit of Pythagoras involved in a slightly different type of question. 
Okay, so find the exact value of tan 30 times sine 60 and give your answer in its simplest form. Now, if you had a question like this, obviously we'd have to start drawing out our triangles and work out what tan 30 and sine 60 is. Quite a nice one, because you only have to use the one triangle for 30 and 60. And if you can remember some of them, you actually can just get away with doing half of the triangle, which is what I'm going to do. And we've got 2, 1, and root 3. And again, we just need to read these values. So I'd be writing down Sokotoa again, just to make sure that you know which ones you're reading. Sokotoa, there we go. And let's just get these two values from the triangle. So tan 30 is opposite over adjacent. So we're looking at the 30. Opposite the 30 is one, and adjacent is root three. So tan 30 is one over root three. There we go, and there's your first one. And the next one is sine 60. So moving on to the sine. 60, looking at the 60 angle, opposite over hypotenuse, opposite is root 3, hypotenuse is 2, so it's root 3 over 2. There we go, and it asks us to multiply these together. So what we've got to do is multiply them together and see what we get. So on the top, 1 times root 3 is root 3, and root 3 times 2 is 2 lots of root 3. So 2 root 3, there we go, and that is finding the exact value there. It does say though give your answer in its simplest form, and that's because of the top and bottom here, divides by root 3. So we can divide the top by root 3, and we can divide the bottom root by root 3, and that will simplify the fraction, just like a normal fraction. So root 3 divided by root 3 is 1, and 2 root 3 divided by root 3 is 2. So our final answer there would be 1 half. Okay. There we go. So it's quite nice and quick to find them once you know those triangles. I think it's quite a nice visual way of, of, of um, actually just being able to find them quite quickly. Um, but you have got to actually know how to draw those triangles and understand where the, these values actually come from. Okay, so looking at this question, it says B is the midpoint of AC. That's this one here. So it says that this is a midpoint. Now straight away, if you have a look on that line, look, A to B is the vector A. And if that's the midpoint of B to C, then this here on the other side has to be exactly the same. So we can label that A straight away. So that's another A. It says M is the midpoint of PB. Let's find that. That's here. M is the midpoint of PB. And if it's the midpoint, it's not in a ratio this time, but a midpoint means it's in the ratio 1 to 1, or 1 half, and the half here. And just also taking note of that, that line there, BP, you can see doesn't have any vectors on. Every other line has a vector on, but B to P or P to B, whichever way we look at it, has no vector on it. So that line there is going to be one that we're going to have to find how to move up and down. It says show that NMC is a straight line. So if I draw that in, let's have a look. NMC, quite hard here without a ruler, but NMC, there we go. That's the line there we're trying to prove is a straight line. Now when it comes to these types of questions where you've got to show it's a straight line, we just need to have a look at this green line here. So there's three vectors I can have a look at on this green line. I can go right from the start, from N, all the way up to C. That's a vector I can have a look at, N to C. Or I could do part of the line. I could go from N just to M. That wouldn't get me part way along the line, so I've got N to M. Or I could go from M, that line there with the cross on, up to C. So three, three possible vectors there that we could have a look at. Now when we're trying to prove something's a straight line, I only have to find two of these. And it tends to be that this one here is the easiest to find, the full length of the line. And I always look for that one first. Then I just pick and choose between one of the other two. And you're gonna see, we're gonna be able to prove something's a straight line because there's gonna be something that is similar within the vectors there when we actually find them. Okay, but we'll go about actually just trying to work them out first and then we'll see at the end how it proves it's a straight line. But N to C, that's quite a nice easy one actually. So I can go from N here, I can go backwards up this 2B. So I'm going to write this down, the vector N to C. So I can go minus 2B, let's have a look, minus 2B, because I'm going backwards through that 2B. And then I can move all the way down the line here from A to C, and that's two of those A's there, so plus 2A. There we go, and there's the vector um, N to C. And I'm just going to rub these lines out, let's get rid of those. Okay, so that's my vector there, and again, I can rewrite that if I want to get rid of the symbols, I can write 2a minus 2b. Okay, so now we have the vector 2a minus b. That is from n to c. Now, that's one of our vectors done. So, let's tick that off, one of the three. Next, let's have a look at one of the other ones. Uh, it doesn't really matter which one we pick, n to m or n m to c, it doesn't really matter. Let's just go for the second one, as it's the second one that I wrote. And we just need to think how we're going to get from n to m there. Okay, so we have two options. Either we could go down here and then up there. 
Or we could go from N to A, A to B, and B down to M, all the way around. Now that's three parts there, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna ignore that one. I'm just gonna go down and up, okay? So to get from N to P, that's okay. That's just down this little vector B here. But then I have to work out how to get from P to M. Now in order to get from P to M, okay, this part here, I need to be able to move up the full length of the line. So I need to know what the full vector there for that line is. And that line is the vector P up to B. So I need to work out P to B now. So let's have a look at how we could go about getting P to B. Okay, and then we'll think about adding all these up together in a sec. So to get from P to B, let's write this one down. I'll write that down over here, P to B. I have to go up here from to A, and then from A over here to B. So to get from P to A, let's have a look, we have to go backwards through this B, and backwards through another two Bs. So that's gonna be minus three Bs, so minus three B and then plus this A up here, so plus A. So minus three B plus A, okay? Now that gets me from P to B. Now we don't wanna know P to B, do we? We want to know how to get from P to M, which is gonna be half of that, okay? So to get from P to M, I'm gonna to have to halve that. There we go, because M is the midpoint, we only wanna go halfway up that line, half of that vector. So we just need to do what we did before, We'll stick a half outside the bracket. I'm not gonna rearrange it here to, to make it A minus three B. I'm just gonna do it as, we, as we've done it here. So minus three B plus A, and we're gonna do half of that. Okay, so if we expand that, let's have a look. A half times minus three. Remember you can always think of these as fractions over one. So a half times minus three is minus three over two. So minus three over two B plus, and a half times one A is a half A. So plus one half A, there we go. And that's our vector P to M. Now we're almost done because if we can get from N to P, which we can, we just go down a B. Now we can get from P to M using this vector here, minus three B plus half A. So if we have a look at this one here, let's label this up. So we're now going from N to M, the full, the full bit there. And in order to do that, we do one B, so B, and then add to that, this vector here that we've just worked out. Okay, so we're gonna bring that down here. Okay, literally the one we've just worked out. So B, and I'm gonna put the, the half A next to it. Let's have a look, in fact, no, let's put the minus three. So it's not gonna be plus, because it's minus three and a half B. So we could put add minus three and a half B, but I'm just gonna get rid of the plus and just put it in there, just to avoid having extra symbols here. So it's B minus three and a half B plus a half A. There we go. Right, so again, we just need to simplify this down. We're almost done, we just need to simplify this. And if we have a think, let's have a think, the B's there in terms of halves. So one B is two halves B, and two halves B, take away three halves B, is gonna leave us with minus a half B. Okay, one take away one and a half is minus a half. So if we right work that out, we've got minus a half B, plus a half A, that half A that we've got there. And that's our final vector there uh, to match that up. Uh, now, that means we've done end to end, so we can tick that off. Okay, now we've got two, we just need to have a look and see if we can compare these. Now I mentioned in the last question, it's very, very important here that we factorize these vectors and we can see if there is anything common between them. We'll have a look. So if I come back to this N to C one, the first one, if I factorize this one here, and rather than rearranging it, I'll factorize this one. I could take two out, and if I take two out, that would leave me with minus a, oh, sorry, minus b, plus a, inside the bracket, okay? And that there is gonna be a really key vector, so I'm gonna highlight that, two lots of minus b plus a. If I do the same again to this one, so if we factorize this one as well, let's just see, that was that one factorized. If we factorize this one, the only thing we can factorize out is a half, so I could take a half out, let's have a look. So take out a half, Divide the first bit by a half, we get minus b. A half divided by a half is one, so minus one b. And then dividing a by a half, we get plus a. There we go. And that's that vector there if we, uh, if we factorize it. And again, I'm gonna highlight that one. And let's just write them down over here next to these vectors that I was gonna work out in the first place. So for n to c, we, had, we have two lots of minus b plus a. And for n to m, the other one we worked out, we've got a half, brackets minus b plus a. 
There we go. So if you have a look, we've obviously got this similar bracket. We've got this same vector in there, minus b plus a. Now, if we've got the same vector there, minus b plus a, it means that the lines are going in the same direction. And if they're going in the same direction and they're connected here at m, then they must be on the same straight line. Because if they're going in the same direction, they're connected together at that point m, then they have to be going in the same straight line. The two there in n to c means that's the full length of that, so it's doing two lots of that vector. The half means that from n to m is half of that vector, which means if we had have worked out this line here, m to c, it would have been th the other three halves or the other one and a half of that vector. Okay, so you'd get three halves of minus b plus a. And you could work that one out as well, but we only ever have to work two out. Now, that is enough to show that it's a straight line, but personally, particularly if it ever says prove or anything like that, I'd just like to write that they both share the same vector. You can, sh you can say that they share different multiples of the vector. One's two lots of it, one's half lots of it. It, but you would, I would normally put a little statement in just pointing an arrow at those brackets and saying that they share the same vector. Okay, so obviously that is quite a tricky one. Um, you know, it's not, not some of the hardest of the vectors, some of these new vectors seem to be very, very tough, but there's a lot going on in that question there and a lot to be thinking about. Okay, so this one says work out 12.5% of 160. So again, we'll work out 10%. So we get our 10% here is going to be 16 when we divide it by 10. Again, we'll halve it for 5%. So that gives us 8, and again halving that for 2.5% would give us a value of 4. So how do we get to 12.5%? Well, 12.5% we could use the 10% and then the additional 2.5%, and that would give us our 12.5%. So again, for this one we just need the 16 and the 4, we just have to add those two together, that gives us an answer of 20, and there we go, final answer. Right, so as you can see, these ones aren't actually too bad. In order to get a 2.5%, you just have to find your 10%, halve it for 5%, and then halve it again for 2.5%, and then just carefully think about your combinations that you're going to put together in order to get to that final answer. So it says Alice and James share £80 in the ratio 3 to 2, work out how much they each receive. Now first things first, whenever I'm looking at a ratio, I always bring it away from the words. So rather than looking at these words here, I'm going to have A and J my Alice and James, I'm just going to bring that away from all the words there. And it says that they share it in the ratio 3 to 2. And obviously not forgetting when it comes to ratios, that first name that's mentioned is uh, correlated or, or relevant to that first number that's mentioned there. So when we obviously have a look at this, we've also got James and James is going to be the 2. So we can pair those up and bring it all away from the words and it says that they share £80 between them. Now when we're looking at the ratio here, that is relating to both these numbers here. So both these people are going to share £80. Now you can do this obviously just numerically or you can actually draw a little picture. Um, but essentially when it comes to a ratio that we just need to think about how many parts that number is referring to. So obviously we've got £80 as our number and that is referring to the total amount of money that they both share. And they both share, look, 3 and 2 and that makes 5 parts. There we go. So they've got five parts between them and that equals 80 pounds. So when it comes to any sort of ratio question, we wanna know what the value of one part is. So if we've got five parts that equal 80 pounds, we can get the value of one part by dividing by five. So we get the value here of one part. There we go. And one part therefore is gonna equal 80 divided by five, which is 16 pounds. There we go. So one part of this money, of this amount that's being shared in this ratio is worth 16 pounds. Now obviously we've got Alice that's getting three of those parts. So Alice is getting three. So Alice is gonna get three times the 16, which is 48 pounds. There we go. And James is getting two of them. And James's share then is two lots of 16, which equals 32 pounds. There we go. And you can always do a little quick check at the end there because those two numbers should add together to make the original 80 and 48 plus 32 adds together to make 80. Now, if you're not really the, the most fond of just doing it via the numbers, you can actually take a different approach to some of these. I won't do it very often because it does actually uh, sort of um, just create a little bit more work for yourself. But if you don't like doing it as the numbers, you could have a think about what this actually looks like in terms of a picture. And I might talk about this a little bit, but if Alice is getting three, if we imagine she's got three little piles of money there, and James has got two. There we go, we know that that 80 pounds gotta be split between those five piles, so we can do 80 divided by five. It's a very similar process, gives us 16. And then you can just fill in each of those little piles of money with 16s. There we go. And then obviously just count them up there. So Alice is getting the three of them, and those three are worth 48. 
and James is getting the two, and that's worth 32. So you could rewrite it as a ratio, 48 to 32. Obviously it's about money, so we should include the pound sign there. But there we go. Now a lot of these questions I'm going to focus on to start with. I am just going to be looking at money. But these questions can be to do with anything. It could be recipes in an ingredient. Uh, ingredients in a recipe, sorry. Or it could be something like, you know, there's quite a lot of questions where it says they're sharing sweets or sharing that, you know, something out. Uh, whatever that may be, we're going to take the same approach. But I'm just going to have a look at money questions just to start with for the, for the starting few. Right, let's have a look at our next question. Okay, so this question looks very similar. It says Tom and Amy share some money in the ratio of five to three, but this time it says Tom gets 70 pounds more than Amy. Work out how much they each receive. So again, let's bring this away from the words. We've got T to A, and it's in the ratio of five to three. Now what it says is Tom gets 70 pounds more than Amy. So Tom, who's this one here, is getting a little bit more. Now if we have a look in terms of the parts, look, Amy's getting three parts, Tom's getting five, so Tom is getting an additional two parts to Amy. So those extra two parts that Tom's getting, it's saying that those plus two parts uh, are worth 70 pounds and from there, we can take exactly the same approach that we did on the last one. Okay, we can divide that by two to get our value of one part. Now again, you could think about this in terms of a picture. We could have Tom's five parts and we could draw five little circles, look, and Amy's two, uh, sorry, three. And then we can just identify in terms of the picture how many more he's getting. Well, he's getting these two extra here. So those two parts here are worth 70 pounds. And again, you can just take a little bit of a logical approach there. Dividing that by two tells you the value of each part, and then you can stick your 35 in each of these piles and start to work it out that way. But I'm just gonna do it via the numbers. Look, we're just gonna divide this by two, and that tells us that one part, which is what we're looking for every time, equals 35 pounds. And then from there, you can take exactly the same approach we can do for Tom. He's got five lots of that, so five times 35. There we are, and 5 times 35 is 175, so Tom's getting 175 pounds. And Amy, who is getting three of those, is going to get three lots of 35. There we go, and 3 times 35 is 105 pounds. And again, you can add those two together. Uh, and to get their total, this one actually doesn't ask for their total, it says how much do they each receive. But if it did, if it said work out the total that they both get, you could actually add those together, look, and we've got 280 as the total. So this question doesn't ask for that, but just thinking about what we could be asked. So we've got Tom gets 175, Amy gets 105, and if it asks for it, we know that they both share 280 pounds between them. So this is following on from what we've just done. It's basically the same as what we've just done. It's just a few more words and a sort of all wrapped up in a problem that looks more complicated than it actually is. It says Tom and Adam have a total of 240 stamps. The ratio of the number of, uh, of Tom stamps to the number of Adam stamps is three to seven. And then it says Tom buys some stamps from Adam and then they have a new ratio. Tom to Adam is now three to five. How many stamps does Tom buy from Adam? Now there's no extra stamps getting added in at any point. We're always having 240. If extra stamps were being added in this problem does get a lot more complicated but this type of problem here look there's only 240 and they're just sort of interchanging some between them so if we have our first scenario look scenario number one we've got 240 stamps and we've got Tom to Adam in the ratio 3 to 7 now that's 240 stamps shared between them so the total amount of parts there is 10 so we've got 10 parts equaling 240 stamps so if we divide that by 10 we get one part equals 24 stamps. So if we actually multiply both these numbers, look, Tom and Adam. Tom gets three times the 24, and Adam has seven times the 24. So if we work both of those out, three times 24 is 72, and Adam has seven times the 24, which comes out as 168. There we go. So that's how many stamps they start with, but we've now got scenario number two, or the second part of this scenario, where Tom and Adam now have stamps in a different ratio, so now it's in the ratio three to five. So now we know it's in the ratio three to five, we can go about splitting these 240 stamps up between them. So we've got three to five, and that is a total of eight parts. So we've got eight parts, that now equal 240 again. So again, we can divide that by eight, and 240 divided by eight gives us a total of 30. So this time, one part in this ratio is equal to 
30 stamps. So if we have a look, I'm just going to do this in a different colour. We've now got Tom, who's getting the three parts, gets three times 30, which is going to equal 90. And Adam is going to have five of them. So Adam gets five times 30, and he gets 150. Right, there we go. So obviously we're looking at, uh, let's have a look at what the question said again. How many stamps does Tom buy from Adam? Well, Tom started with 72. Now he has 90. So we can obviously work out the difference there. If we want to show our working out, we can do the 90 stamps that he now has, take away the 72 that he started with, and that leaves us with a total of 18 stamps that he must have bought there. So 18 stamps would be our final answer. And obviously we could have taken that from Adam as well. We could obviously look at the fact that Adam, who's here, started with 168 and then dropped down to 150, which is a loss of 18 stamps as well. So you could look at that in both different ways, but there we go, there's a difference of 18. Okay, so again, there's nothing more complicated in this question. It's just, there's a little bit of different wording going on. So it says, Maria, Dylan and Kate share 3,000 pounds. The ratio that of the amount that Maria gets to the amount that Dylan gets is in the ratio five to four. And Kate gets 1.5 times the amount that Dylan gets. Work out the amount of money that Dylan gets. So we wanna have a look, how are we actually gonna create this ratio? Because at the moment we've got Maria, we've got Dylan, and we've got Kate, but it only tells us the ratio, and that's, uh, let's just highlight that, Dylan and Maria, or Maria and Dylan, five to four. So we've got five to four for Maria and Dylan, but we don't know how much Kate gets in terms of parts of the ratio. But it does then say, Kate gets 1.5 times the amount that Dylan gets. So Dylan gets four parts, so if we times that by 1.5, that actually gives us a value of six. So Kate is getting six parts. Remembering multiplying by 1.5, if you don't have a calculator, just adds an extra half on. Half of four is two, add it on gives us six. So now that we've multiplied that by 1.5, the rest of the question's nice and easy. Because all we're gonna do now is split that 3,000 pounds in the question in the ratio five to four to six. So if I get rid of this little bit of working out, this times 1.5, let's have a look. In total, that ratio adds up to 15 parts. And now we know that those 15 parts equal the 3,000 pounds. So we can find the value of one part again by dividing by 15. And 3,000 divided by 15 gives us a value of 200. There we go. So they all get 200. So we can go about times them all by 200. We're actually only concerned about Dylan in this particular question. And Dylan gets these four parts here. So we can just answer that straight away. Dylan's four parts, each one of them's 200 quid. So four times 200 gives us 800 pounds for Dylan. There we go, and there is our final answer. And again, you could go about obviously finding out the amount that they all get. We could do Maria times 200, which is 1,000, and Kate times 200, which is 1,200. And you could even add them all together then and show that there's 3,000 pounds there. But that's how we'd approach a slightly different question here. We've got to think about creating the ratio slightly ourselves. So this question on the screen here, it says, only blue vans and white vans are made in a factory. It says the ratio of the number of blue vans to the number of white vans is four to three. And it says for the blue vans, the number of small vans to the number of large vans is three to five. Work out the fraction of the number of vans made in the factory that are blue and large. Okay, so we're looking at these ones that are blue and large. Now, as, it, as this sort of uh, question develops and this sort of gets a little bit harder, there's a specific approach that I'm gonna take when I'm actually looking at these. And that is I'm gonna kind of structure this in the same way that you would structure a probability tree. And looking at this as more more on the lines of work out the probability of picking a van that's blue and large out of all of these uh, sort of vans in the factory. And sort of way that's what I'm going to draw this then is I'm going to draw a bit of a probability tree. So I'm going to start by saying uh, blue to white. Okay, so we've got the vans, they're blue or they're white. Now over here we've got the ratio of blue and white, we've got four to three. Now that's out of seven in total. So four out of the seven there are blue and three out of the seven there are white. So for the blue here we've got four out of seven. And for the white here, we've got three out of seven. There we go. And then it gives us the next piece of information. Now it only mentions anything to do with the blue vans here. And as these sort of questions develop, we're gonna have a look at ones where it mentions something about both branches here. But in this particular question, look, it just says for the blue vans, we've got small and large. So we're only gonna do another branch coming off the blue vans here. And that's gonna be our small ones and our large ones. And again, we've got a ratio here, it's three to five, so it's out of eight in total. So for the small vans there, that's the three, and that's three out of eight. And for the large vans there, it's five, and again, that's five out of eight. 
Now when it comes to actually working out the fraction here that are blue and large, we treat it in the same way that we do a probability tree. We have a look, okay, we go up the blue branch and we get four out of seven for the blue. And then we go up the large root or down the large root, depending on how you've drawn it here. And that's five out of eight, okay? And just double check that you've put those in the right place. That's large, five out of eight, that's right. So that's blue and large. So all we do normally when we're going along a tree like this is we just multiply those fractions together and we're not going to do anything different in this question. So all we're going to do is we're going to take that first fraction there for blue, which is four sevenths, and I'm going to multiply it by the large fraction there, which is five eighths. There we go. And multiplying fractions is nice and easy. We just times the top and times the bottom. So four times five is 20, and seven times eight on the bottom is 50. Six. There we go, and that's our final answer. 20 out of 56 is our fraction of the vans in the factory here that are blue and large. Okay, so hopefully that makes it quite nice and simple to understand, but essentially we just pair together the two fractions that we're looking at and multiply them together, just like we would on a probability tree. We're gonna deal with this one here, where we've got y is inversely proportional to d squared, and then we're gonna deal with this one here, where we've got d is directly proportional to x squared. So treating it in the same way, let's create a formula for this first one. So y is equal to, and it's inverse proportion, so k over d squared. And then again, we can sub these numbers in. We've got d is 10 when y is 4. So we've got 4, which produces y is equal to k over d squared. And again, the working out to the side, we've got 10 squared, which equals 100. So k over 100. And again, let's rearrange that so times both sides by 100 so we've got our value for k and we get k is equal to 400 and again we can write our formula for that so let's bring that down here let's write y is equal to 400 divided by d squared right there we go there's our first one done let's move on to our second statement here so d is directly proportional to x squared so there we go, let's write our formula for that. So d equals k x squared. There we are. And let's plug in those values. So x is two and d is 24. So we have 24 equals k times, if I can write that in, times two squared. And again, let's do the working out down here. Two squared equals four. So k times four. Or again, let's rewrite that as 4k. So let's get rid of that and write 4k instead. There we go. Okay, so to rearrange that, we're gonna divide both sides by four. So divide by four, and we get k equals, and we get a value of six there. So there we go, k equals six, and again, we can rewrite our formula there, but having k as six. So if we write that down here again, we have got d is equal to six x squared. And there we go, there's our two formulas written. Now again, if we just read this question carefully, it says find a formula for y in terms of x. So we have this formula on the left here that says y is equal to 400 over d squared. Now that's a formula for y in terms of d. So we need to replace this d here. And we've got this formula over here that says d is equal to 6x squared. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put that 6x squared in place of d. And if we do that, let's see what we get. So we'll get y is equal to 400 over d squared. Now d is 6x squared, so I'm gonna put that in a bracket. So 6x squared, and that is gonna be squared. Okay, so we're nearly done. Right, we just need to square what's on the bottom there. So y is equal to, we've got 400 on the top, and if we square what's on the bottom, six squared is 36, and x squared squared is x to the power of four. Remembering that you just times powers when they're in brackets like that. So there we go, 400 over 36, x to the power of four. Now again, it does say give it in its simplest form. We're almost done, but the top and bottom here both divide. Now they both divide by, and you might not spot the, you know, the biggest number straight away, but they both divide by four. So on the top there, 400 divided by four is 100. And on the bottom there, 36 divided by four is nine. So nine x to the power of four. And then that is in its simplest form, 109. Both don't divide by anything similar. So y is equal to 100 over 9x to the power of four. And to finish this off really, I should get rid of that little step of working out in the middle. So I can write my final answer as y is equal to 100 divided by 
9x to the power of 4 and there is our final answer so let's just highlight that one there okay so this is quite an interesting question because this is talking about density and obviously we're doing this non-calculator and normally density is a calculator based question so hopefully we're going to have some nice numbers now as soon as you see that word density in a question you're going to want to write down your formula whether you use a formula or whether you use a formula triangle so i'll write down the formula triangle because that works for everybody then so that's going to be density is equal to mass divided by volume now this question says it wants us to work out the mass. So straight away, if I cover up the mass, that means I'm gonna do density and multiply it by my volume. So this question gives us a cube and it says the rubber cube has side lengths of four centimeters. So in regards to this image here, we've got four centimeters across there, four centimeters here and a four centimeter height. So to work out the volume of a cube, you would just multiply all those numbers together or in other words, four times four times four. Obviously take that in stages, 4 times 4 is 16, times that by 4 again, and that is going to be 64. So 64 and the units are centimetres, so it's 64 centimetres cubed. Now it gives us the density, it says the density is 1.5, so we know to do this we do the density, 1.5, and multiply that by the volume, and the volume is 64. So we just need to do 1.5 times 64, which isn't too bad. When you are multiplying by 1.5, that just adds on an extra half. Obviously, you can hop the decimal out. You could do the working out to the side. So if we do that, we'll get 64 times 15. 5 times 4 is 20. 5 times 6 is 30. Add the 2 is 32. Put our placeholder in. 1 times 4 and 1 times 6 is nice and easy. And if we add that together, 0 six and nine so you get 960 and then you just have to hop the decimal back in one jump as we took it out at the start so when you jump that in you get 96.0 so that would be 96 and in the units it said grams per centimeter cubed so that would be 96 grams as our final answer so there we go we'll get 96 grams so as you can see we can have density questions that are non-calculator but you're going to tend to get nicer decimals involved they're just going to be a little bit nicer for your calculations. This question says in a bag there are red, blue, yellow and green counters. A counter is taken at random from the bag and the table shows the probability of getting each coloured counter. So we've got red, blue and yellow and we're missing green. Then it says later in the question, look it says uh, there are 45 green counters in the bag. Work out the total number of counters in the bag. So if we have a look here, we just need to figure out what's missing. What's that probability of getting green to start with? Because it's slightly different. It's not saying how many times they're going to pick the counters out or something along those lines. It's actually given us an actual amount of counters allocated to that probability. So at the moment, if we add all of these up, we've got 0 0.3, 0 0.25 and 0 0.15. And they add up to 0 0.7 or 0 0.70. There we are. So we're missing 0 0.3, which again is 30 there we go so 30% of the counters are green and it says down here there are 45 green counters so this is actually telling us that 30% is actually equal to 45 counters there we go so that 30% there is 45 counters and we need to find out the original amount of counters or the total amount of counters in the bag and in order to do that, we need to turn that 30% back into 100%. So this is almost like a reverse percentage because we need to break this down in order to turn it back into 100. We can't just multiply it by two or multiply it by three. It's not gonna get us to 100%. So if we go about breaking this down, always look, how can we get back to that 10%? And to get 30% back to 10%, we would have to divide that by three. And that would tell us that 10% is equal to 15 counters when we divide that by three. There we go, so 10% is 15 counters. And now we're able to turn that back into 100. And from 10% back to 100 is nice and easy because we just need 10 of those. So times it by 10. So that original 100% of the counters is 150. There we go. And there's our final answer. So a slightly different bit of wording there actually allocates the amount of counters to that certain percentage. So it's called a reverse percentage. Obviously, because it's not given us the hundred percent, it's given us part of it, and it's looking us looking for us to go back or build it back to a hundred percent. 
Okay, so that's a different sort of approach, a different sort of question. Now when it comes to independent events, we're gonna talk about it throughout the video, but an independent event is just two events where the second event is not affected by the first event. And we'll have a look at why it's not affected in these types of different questions, but it's just, that's all that it means there. It just means that the one event that we're looking at is not gonna be affected by the other. So let's have a look at this question. Now, in a lot of these questions, you'll normally actually be given a tree, but in none of the ones that I'm gonna have a look at, I'm actually gonna to give to the tree. We're just gonna draw them all ourselves, because obviously if you're not given the tree, it's important that you're able to do that anyway. And if you are, then that's uh, you know, uh, you know, know, easier for you. So the, we're gonna just gonna have a look at these slightly harder questions here. So James has a bag of counters, and in the bag there are four red and five blue, and James takes a random a counter from the bag and notes its colour. He then puts the counter back in the bag, and that's an important bit we're going to discuss there, and takes at random a second counter. And we're going to work out the probability that James takes two different coloured counters. So that line there where it says he puts the counter back in the bag, that there is what determines that this is an independent event. Because after we take the first counter, if we put one back in the bag, the second time we're just actually just taking a counter from exactly the same bag of counters. So it doesn't actually matter whether we take a red or a blue. So let's have a look at constructing this via a tree. So if we draw a little tree here, we're gonna draw two branches that represent red and blue. Okay, and that is gonna be representing our first pick of the counters there. I'm gonna label this part of the tree. So that's the first time we take a counter. Now let's write the probabilities in. So looking over there, we've got four red and five blue. So in total there, we've got nine counters. So you can do that working out to the side if you want. Four plus five equals nine. So if we're gonna write the probabilities here. I'm gonna write them as fractions, just keep it nice and easy. Obviously you can write it as decimals if you like, but I think in the case of this question, it's probably easier for us to write it as a fraction. So for red, it's four reds out of nine. So the probability of getting a red is four out of nine. And then we've got blue and that is five out of nine. There we go. And just thinking about these fractions here, obviously if you were given the tree and you were just, and you, you know, you didn't have the information up there and it said that the red was four ninths, you'd have to actually work out the blue there. And obviously the numerators have to add up to whatever that denominator is. If it's four out of nine, that tells you there's nine counters, four of them being red, and therefore five of them have to be blue in order to make nine out of the four and the five. So just thinking about that, if you weren't given the, uh, you know, the information in the question, you'd have to actually do that yourself on the tree. Now obviously what we have, we have a little scenario here and I always like to think of it as a bit of a journey. So if we imagine a little person standing over here at the start, not the best drawing there, but we could either go on a little journey. Now we could take a red out of the bag, in which case our little person was end up, would end up here. And then we'd have our second counter. So at this point, we can construct the second part of our tree. And I'm gonna run out a little, a little bit of space here. And this is gonna represent the second pick. Now on this second pick here, look at this part of the journey. We've taken a red counter, and now we're gonna take another one. And again, that can be red or blue. And because the counter's gone back in the bag, again, it's gonna be four ninths, and it's gonna be five ninths again for blue. And that is that one part of the journey. But of course we might not have taken a red out. So if we get rid of our little person here and let's imagine that actually instead we've taken out a blue and we've gone down this part of the journey here. We've taken out a blue counter. So here we are, we've taken out a blue. Now again, we're gonna take a second counter. Okay, and that again can be red or blue. So we'll label that up, red or blue. And again, the probabilities are just gonna be exactly the same. It doesn't matter whether I took a red or whether I took a blue, it's still four ninths and five ninths as that counter has been put back in the bag. So we've constructed our tree and let's have a look. Let's just get rid of all of this. Um, we now just need to work out this probability. And now the question says, work out the probability that James takes two different colored counters. And there are two ways that I can actually do that. So to get different colors, I could, and I'm just gonna squiggle along the lines and this is how I do it. I go up the red and then I'd have to take a blue. And the two probabilities that you go through on this journey are, the, are really important. So we went through four ninths when we took the red and we finished on the five ninths. So to work out the probability of that route happening, all we do is we multiply those two fractions together. And all you've got to remember is you times when you go across the tree. So if we times them together, we've got four ninths and we're gonna times that by five ninths, and that's really nice and easy, not to forget when you're multiplying fractions, you multiply the top numbers, so four times five is 20, 
and 9 times 9 is 81. So the probability of getting a red and then a blue is 20 out of 81. Now, not that that one um, can simplify, but you do not need to simplify fractions when it comes to probability. And the reason being is that that probability there, 20 out of 81, tells us something quite important. It tells us that there are 20 different ways of this happening out of a possible 81 different ways uh, of picking all these counters. That can seem a little bit hard to understand sometimes, but if we labelled the red ones to 1 to 4 and the blue ones, let's say 1 to 5, there are, there are 20 different ways of taking a red then a blue. I could take red counter number 1 and then blue counter number 1. Or I could take red counter number one and then blue counter number two, etc., etc. Obviously, they're all still red and blue, but if they would had different numbers on, and we we think of them as you know all different counters. Then there are twenty different ways of doing that. Now, what we're going to have a look at now is the other way of getting two different counters. Because I could take instead of a red then a blue, and let's think I'm just going to do a different colour here. I could take a blue, and then I could take a red. And that would also give me different colour counters. And again, that goes through these two different fractions, so five ninths and four ninths. And if we times them together, you'll probably notice here that actually we're going to get the same answer because it's the same two fractions in reverse. And 4 ninths times 5 ninths, again on the top we get 20, and again on the bottom we get 81. But that there is taking a blue, then a red. Okay, And there are 20 ways of doing that as well. So there are 20 ways of getting a red, then a blue, and 20 ways of getting a blue, then a red. So the total probability there, in order to get our final answer, we just need to add these two together to combine them to get the total probability there. So 20 plus 20 on the top gives us 40 out of the possible 81 ways. Remember, you don't add the, uh, the denominators together there when adding fractions. And that would give us our final answer, 40 out of 81. Okay, so a few different things to be thinking about there. One was constructing the tree, thinking about obviously our first pick and our second pick. And then the next one was obviously multing, multiplying across the tree. And any different combinations that we have at the end, we just add them together and combine them together. Of course, you might get a nice easy question here. It might just say, what's the probability of taking two reds? In which case, you only need to do the one journey. Have a look at the tree there that goes through the four ninths and the four ninths. So you just times them together and that'll be your answer. But if there are, if there are multiple answers, you just need to think about adding them together at the end. These questions, we've now got some decimals introduced. So not necessarily harder. In fact, you might, you know, depending on which ones you prefer, I think that I personally think they're just as easy as each other. But obviously these are slightly different when we've got decimals involved. So it says Hannah is going to play one game of darts and one game of snooker. And the probability she'll win at darts is 0.3. And the probability that she'll win at snooker is 0.4. Work out the probability that Hannah will win at least one game. Now, win at least one game we'll talk about that in a sec and let's have a look at how we're going to go, to go about this but first we need to construct our tree so looking at this we've got the first part of our tree could be our first game and the first game that it mentions is darts so let's just have darts as our first one now we've got in this a scenario of winning or losing and it says the probability that she will win at darts is 0 0.3. Now hopefully you already know that probabilities have to add up to 1. Now 0 0.3 is 30%, so obviously to get it up to 100% or to get it up to 1 is 70% or 0 0.7. So the probability of losing this time is 0 0.7. Now we've got the scenario where she's going to play her second game, so she can win or lose if she wins. Then she goes on to play her next game here, which is snooker. Let's label that. Just about fit that in, snooker. And it, again, it's a win or a lose. And the probability that she wins this game is 0 0.4. Now again, that's 40%, so 60% to get to 100, or 0 0.6 to get us up to 1. And that is the scenario there if she wins at darts. She can then win or lose at snooker. So obviously we could lose at darts, in which case, again, she's going to want to go on to play snooker. And again, the probability that she wins is 0.4 and 0.6. It doesn't say that anything changes, you know. It might say in a question, you know, if she wins on the first game or if she wins at darts, then she's got, you know, a higher chance of winning at snooker maybe. Uh, but it doesn't mention anything like that in the question. So both of those parts of the branches are just going to be replicated down below. Now it says here, work out the probability she'll win at least one game. Now if we have a look at the outcomes at the end of each part of the tree here, we've got this outcome up here, which is a win and then a win. We've got the one below that, which is winning at darts but losing at snooker. We've got the bottom here, which is uh, obviously going down our, our bottom branch there on darts, which is a lose and then a win. And then we've got a loss and then a loss down the bottom there. Now this language here says win at least one game. Now at least one game does mean that you uh, could win both. So we could have this route here. Well, that's winning at least one game. Yes, she wins both, and that's definitely at least one. And then we've also got the one below, where she wins one and loses one. And then the one below that, where she loses one 
and wins one. Now that is the probability of winning at least one game. The only one we don't want is that one down the bottom, losing both. So if we just go ahead and work out all the probabilities here for the top three, and then we can get all these probabilities, these different probabilities of winning at least one game. So for the first one there, let's have a look. And I'm, I'm going to have three branches here, so I don't want to squiggle all over it. But if we go the win-win, we've got 0.3 multiplied by 0.4, and that is 0.12, 0.12. We've got 0.3 times 0.6 for the one below. And there we go, 0.3 times 0.6 is 0.18. And then the one below that, 0 0.7 times 0 0.4, which gives us 0 0.28. Now there are our three different probabilities, 0 0.12, 0 0.18 and 0 0.28. So just like before, all we need to do is add them all together and that will give us our combined probability uh, of all those three different outcomes. So you can do them to the side, you've got 0 0.12, you've got 0 0.18 and 0 0.28. 28 and when you add those all together again you may or may not have a calculator here let's have a look what we get so 8 2 3 4 5 0 0.58 and there is our final answer which you can write down here 0 0.58 as our total probability there we go and let's highlight that now obviously that's um, one way of doing it. There is another way of doing it. Again, we could have actually just worked out the probability of losing both and then subtracted that from one. Now, obviously that uh, introduces another method here, thinking about obviously just eliminating the one that we don't want. Um, but that is another method that you could have done as well. I'm thinking about how that works. If we'd have done the probability of a loss and then a loss, that would have been 0 0.7 times 0 0.6, which is 0 0.42. And you can do one takeaway 0 0.42, which would leave us with what's left over, which is 0 0.58. Okay, so you can do that, it's a little bit quicker. Um, but obviously if you just wanna follow the same method and just work out all the roots of the ones you want, then just follow this same approach here and just pick out the ones you want showing all you're working out. Okay, so looking at a cumulative frequency graph, when we have to draw one of these, the first thing you want to have a look at in the table is if this word here says frequency or cumulative frequency. So as it says frequency, we're going to have to actually find the cumulative frequency, which we can do just by adding up as we go down the rows. So we start with 4, then we get an additional 18, that takes us to 22. Then we've got an additional 24, so that's going to take us to 46. And an extra 40 there, so that's 86. Adding on an extra 24 gets us to 110. And then we finish off with the extra 10, which finishes on 120. And that's good because that matches up to the top of our axes there when we have that 120. Now when we're plotting one of these, we're just going to plot against the n numbers, so those n numbers there on the intervals, and that means just plotting it on the graph. So we've got 10, and that goes up to 4. Now this is obviously quite small on my screen, but you just need to plot it as accurately as you can. So I'll try and do it as best as I can, but this should give you a good idea. And then we've got 22 as our cumulative frequency. We're gonna plot that against 20. So I'm gonna go just above 20 there for the um, actual value, so just on 22. 30 goes up to 46. Again, I'll try and do that as accurately as I can. 40 goes to 86. There we go. And 50 goes to 110 which is a bit easier to plot, and then 60 goes to 120, which is right at the top. So when you are joining these up, make sure you look at the starting number, which in this case is zero. So we're gonna go from zero with a nice smooth curve through all those points, not using a ruler, and there is our cumulative frequency graph drawn. Now for part B in this question, it says to find an estimate of the interquartile range, and it wants us to use the graph for that. So when we're finding an estimate of the interquartile range, we need to obviously find the quartiles. So if we look at our total, which is 120, and then we divide that by 4 to find the quarter, each of the quartiles is going to be 30, above the bottom and 30 down from the top. So if we find 30 on our axes, and again, you can do this a lot more accurately when you have the paper in front of you, but that is 30 just there. I'm going to go across to my curve, and then I'm going to go down. I'm going to read the value as accurately as I can. So that for me comes out as 23, and that is my lower quartile. I'm then going to do the same from the top, so go down 30 from the 120, that's going to be down at 90. And I'll go across again to my curve using a pencil and a ruler, and then go down again as neatly as you can. 
and I am going to land there on 43. Okay, so I've got my values. I have my upper quartile, which has come out as 43, my lower quartile, which has come out as 23. So to get the interquartile range, we just do 43, take away 23, and that leaves me with an interquartile range of 20, and that would be my final answer, and that's how I go about finding the interquartile range. So it says here there are 10 boys and 20 girls in a class and the class has a test. It says the mean mark for all the class is 60 and the mean mark for the girls is 54. Work out the mean for the boys. So when it comes to a question like this, obviously we know, or hopefully we know, that when we're normally working out a mean, we get the total, we divide by how many people there are or how many things there are, and we get our mean. Okay, so we do the total and we divide by the amount, okay, for whatever it is. There we are, and it's most basic sense there with the mean, using the total divided by the amount. Well, in this question here, obviously it doesn't actually give us the total. It tells us what the mean is, it tells us the amount, it tells us that there are 10 boys and 20 girls, but it doesn't actually tell us the total. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go backwards to work out some of these totals, okay? So we're gonna think about this in reverse. All right, and that is how you get the mean there, the total divided by the amount. Okay, so if we link some of these things up then, it says that there are 10 boys. It doesn't give us the mean for the boys, so that's no good so far. So that first piece of information that we are actually given in terms of the mean, it says the mean mark for the whole class is 60. Well, if we were going to work out the mean for the whole class, we'd get their total. Let's call that x. We divide it by the amount, and in this case, the whole class, well, there's 10 boys and 20 girls, so we would divide it by 30, and it would give us this mean here, which it says is 60. So in other words, we're looking for a number that divides by 30 that gives us the answer 60, and we can just do that in reverse. We can just do 60 times 30. So actually, all we're going to do in these questions is we're going to link the mean that we're given with the amount that is appropriate for that mean. So I'm going to get rid of this little bit of algebra that I've drawn here, but obviously you could think of it in terms of an equation, but this is the sort of concept that we're going to run throughout this question. And, and hopefully once you actually get your head around this and why we multiply instead of divide, uh, obviously we are doing a reverse. This question obviously becomes a lot easier then. Okay, so obviously thinking about this topic's actual name, it's called a reverse mean. Normally when you work out the mean, you do a divide, and obviously then the opposite or the reverse of dividing is multiplying, and in these questions we're going to be multiplying rather than dividing to go backwards. So let me get rid of that. So let's have a look. So obviously we've been given that the mean for the whole class is 60, and we've just established that there's 30 students or 30 people in the whole class. So we're going to do 60 times by those 30 students, and that's going to tell us their total. So 6 times 3 is 18, add on the two noughts, that's 1,800, and that is the total for the whole class. And it's usually worth just labelling these, particularly if you haven't quite got your head around it. Let's just label that total for class. There we go. Right, so the next bit of information then, we've also been told that the mean mark for the girls is 54. Now, in terms of the question, look, there are 20 girls. So if there's 20 girls and their mean is 54, we'll take their mean, 54, times it back by that 20 to find out what their total was. So 54 times 20, there we go, and that gives us 1,080. And there we go, there is the total for the girls. And let's just label that again. Total for girls. Right, so just thinking logically about the information that we've got here, we've got a class of boys and girls. It says the total for the class is 1,800. The total for the girls is 1,080. So logically, we can work out now the total for the boys. We can subtract those away from each other. So 1,800, take away 1,080. And let's write that down. There we go, take away 1,080. Leaves us with 720. There we go, and that's the total for the boys. Let's label that up, total for boys. And now we can go about answering the question because now we know the total for the boys, we can actually think about working out their mean and that's what the question wanted. It said work out the mean for the boys. So we've got the total for the boys is 720 and in total up here, we were given in the question, let's highlight it in the same color, there are 10 boys. So to work out the mean, just like normal, we would just finish this off by saying the total for the boys is 720. And we're gonna divide that by how many boys there are, which is 10, and that gives us a mean of 70. Two. There we go, and there's our final answer. And just thinking about what we did there, just working backwards through the question, multiplying the means by the amount to get the totals, and then using a bit of logic there to find out, therefore, what the total for the boys must have been, and then just working out the mean as normal. If you're only going to watch one video this year, this is the one. With GCSE Maths right around the corner, I'm going to show you three easy steps to maximise your grade using minimal effort. Step one. 
head to the TGMT hub, go to the bottom of the page once you've logged in and access the revision quiz. From here you can answer a question on every topic within the GCSE. You can go through working through each question and making sure that you practice absolutely everything. Once you've done that, you are going to get a full report that shows you exactly what you got right and wrong on all of these questions. So work your way through the quiz and then access your report. From here you can see an individual units, what you need to work on and what you've already secured. So identify what you need to work on. Then we're on to step two. Head back to the hub. You can go through the units, you can go to the exact one that you know that you need to work on and you can access all the individual topics within that unit. Once you've done that, you can pick the topics that you want to work on, watch the video, and you can complete a topic quiz for that particular topic. So work your way through the quiz, answer those questions, and then you're going to get another report. That's going to show you exactly what you got right and wrong, so that you know if you need to do any more work. Step three, head back to the hub and go to the bottom. You can now go on to the upgrade quiz. On here, you're going to be able to answer questions again, different to the first on every single topic within the GCSE. Once you've done that, you're going to get another quiz breakdown under a report that shows you exactly what you got right and wrong, so you can put any of those finishing touches in before that exam comes along. With the exams right around the corner, we need to make sure that we make revision simple. Join upgrade. Work out 2.6 times 3.4. Now what we're actually going to do is we're actually just going to remove the decimal here. So I'm going to hop this decimal out of 2.6. That's not drawn that in very well. Let's have a look at doing that again. Hop the decimal out of 2.6, which makes it 26. And we'll hop the decimal out of 3.4, making it 34. So technically what we've done there is we've multiplied both these numbers by 10. We've multiplied 2.6 by 10 to make it 26. And we've multiplied 3.4 by 10 to make it 34. And we're going to do this sum here, 26 times 34. And at the end, we'll do the reverse of that. So we'll divide by both those 10s and we'll hop the decimal back in. Now I'm going to use a different method of multiplication here. I'm going to use the lattice method. You can use column, you can use grid, you can use whatever method you like. But I'm just going to opt for using the lattice method. So making a little lattice here and we're going to do 26 times 34 okay so let's fill this in and see what we get so 2 times 3 for this top left box gives us 6 6 times 3 gives us 18 onto the bottom 2 times 4 gives us 8 and 6 times 4 gives us 24 and adding these up from the right to the left so 4 we've got 8, 8 and 2 that's 16, 17, 18 so 8 carry the 1 and then 6, 1 makes 7, plus that extra 1 makes 8, and a 0 in the end there. So our final number, reading from left to right, 0, 8, 8, 4, so 884. Okay, so finishing this off, because it was 2.6 and 3.4, so up here there was two place value hops that we've done there. We've hopped out twice, so I'm just going to hop back in twice, and we get 8.84. So then just rewriting that nice and neat, 8.84 is our final answer. A little good tip when you're practicing these is you can always check it on a calculator just to make sure that you've done it right, but that should always work for you there following that process. Right, okay, so this question says two and one seventh take away one and a quarter. Okay, work that out and give your answer in its simplest form. Now it doesn't mention anything about it being a mixed number, so that obviously gives us a bit of a hint that we're not gonna have a mixed number here. We're just gonna go about this process in exactly the same way as when we were adding, okay? Adding and subtracting, the process is the same, except obviously we're not gonna add our fractions together at the end, we're gonna take them away from each other. So we're gonna make them top heavy to start with, turn them into improper fractions. So two and one seventh, two times seven is 14, add the one is 15 over seven. And the one on the right, and we're obviously taking these away. One times the four is four. Add the extra one on top there is five quarters. And there we go. And we just need to make these have a common denominator. And again, we'll look for the lowest common multiple here. So seven times four uh, is 28. That does actually give us the lowest common multiple there. So we're going to make the denominators out of 28. So we're going to times the right fraction by seven. Okay, that's top and bottom. And we're going to times the left fraction by four. And again, that's going to be top and bottom. So our two fractions are going to be out of 28, so I'm just going to write two blank, blank fractions here. I know what the denominators are going to be, I just need to figure out those numerators. So 4 times 15 on the top of the left one gives us 60, and 5 times 7 on the top of the right one gives us 35. There we go, so we've got 60 over 28, take away 35 over 28. 
So again, the denominator isn't going to change. We're just going to write how many 28s we have left. And put 60, take away 35 there, leaves us with 25. There we go. So that is our final answer there. We get 25 over 30, uh, over 28, sorry. Okay, so again, just have a quick look. Does that simplify? Are there any numbers that go into 25 and 28? Um, no. Okay, if 25 divided, divided by 5, 1 and 25, and, and none of those apart from 1 obviously go into 28, so it doesn't simplify. So again, it says give your answer in its simplest form, but again, we've we got the lowest common multiple there for the denominator and made sure that they're the ones we use. So a little hint for you there is always look for that lowest common multiple, okay? In the case of these two, they were quite nice because it was just the uh, two denominators times together, but you always want to have a look for that lowest common multiple just to avoid having to do that simplifying at the end there. But there we go, that is fully simplified. Right, okay, so more Applying these two mixed numbers then. So we've got three and a half, so big times the bottom is six, add the one is seven, so seven halves. And we're going to multiply that by one times the five is five, add the three is eight, so eight fifths. There we go. And that's really nice and simple again, as we've mentioned. All you do is times the top times the bottom. So we've got seven times eight, which is 56. There we go. And on the bottom there, we've got two times five which is 10. Now again, completely up to you whether you simplify at this point. I'm just going to turn it into a mixed number and then simplify it. 10 goes into 55 times with a remainder of 6, so we get 5 and 6 tenths. But again, at this point here, that little fraction there does need simplifying. Okay, so 5 and 6 and 10 both divide by 2, so we get 3 over 5 when we divide them both by 2 and there's our final answer. Again though, just a little note obviously because we could have simplified it first. These numbers here both divide by 2. 58 divided by 2 is 28 and on the bottom there that would be 5 and then you could turn it to a mixed number from there. So 5 goes into 25 5 times with a remainder of 3. So 5 and 3 fifths, okay, if you want to take that approach instead, completely up to you. Okay, so for this one we are going to work out 3 fifths of 65. So again, just like before, to start with, we are going to work out one fifth. So to get one fifth, we're going to divide by five. So for one fifth, we're going to do 65 divided by the denominator there, which is five. And again, if you're not sure on that, just do some division to the side. You might know how to do that uh, mentally if you want, but five goes into six once, remainder one, and into 15 three times. So there we go, the answer is 13. So 65 divided by 5 is 13, and that's 1 fifth. And then again, flipping to the numerator, because we want 3 of those, so we're going to times that by 3. So for 3 fifths, we are going to take the 13, multiply it by 3, and that gives us an answer 39. And again, you can do your working out to the side if you need to for any of those. But there we go, that's how we're going to work out a fraction of an amount. So divide by the denominator to get one of them, whatever that denominator may be, and then multiply by the numerator, and that's going to give us our answer for working out whatever fraction we're looking for, whether it be 2 sevenths, 4 ninths, 3 elevenths, whatever it would be. So divide by the denominator, and then multiply by the numerator. So for this one here, very, very similar. It says 2 sevenths of a number is 18. Well, if 2 sevenths, and again, I'm going to do this without a diagram now. So if 2 sevenths is equal to 18, to get 1 seventh, we would want to divide that by 2. And if we divide that by 2, we would get that 1 seventh is going to be equal to 9. And again, I can just put here that I've divided that by 2. So if 1 7 is equal to 9, then we can get the original number by multiplying it by 7 because we know if it was split into 7 parts, each of them has a 9 in. So we would do, and you could write it as 7 7 7 7 would be equal to 9 times 7, which is equal to 63. So our number there would be 63, and that would be our final answer. Okay, so that's how you work out these questions in reverse. Okay, so this question says, prove algebraically that 0.27 can be written as three over 11 and the recurrings above the two and the seven. Now that means there's two recurring decimals in this question. There's a recurring pattern of twos and sevens. When there's two dots there, the dots indicate the start and the end of the pattern. So in this case, it's a two, seven, two, seven, two, seven, that's just gonna keep on going. But we're gonna follow the same approach. We have x equals 0.27. Now, if I was to times this by 10, and I'm going to get rid of this because it's not, you're going to see it's not going to work. If I was to times it by 10, I'd get 2 point, and then it'd be 7, 2. And if I leave the same amount of decimals as above, look, you can see there that they don't line up. So times it by 10 in this case is not going to work. So instead, we're going to have to times it by 100. That's just going to shift them along two places. So if we times it by 100, we get 27 point, 
and then it's 2, 7. And now these can actually be taken away from each other. Now again, I tend not to write the working out to the side, but 27.27 take away 0.27. You can see there's quite nice. It just leaves us with 27. We get 0, 0, 7 take away 0 is 7 and two, so we get 27. So when we take these away from each other, it's quite nice. 100x take away 1x is 99x, and 27 on the right. Now that's quite nice, no decimals have appeared in this one, so we can turn that straight into a fraction. So x equals 27 over 99, and then again we have that important step here of showing how we're gonna simplify it. So to get from 99 down to 11, which is what it wants us to get to in the question, three over 11, we're gonna to have to divide by nine. And we're gonna do the same to the top there. So 27 divided by nine is three, and 99 divided by nine is 11. And it might be that you just have to show some division working out there. And if we do get to a point where I think we need to actually show our working out, I will do so. But there we go, there's our answer for that one. Okay, so working out 45% of 64. It's a little trickier here because it doesn't end in a zero, but just straight away, let's think about our process. So we're gonna work out 10% straight away, and we'll work that out in just a second. We're also gonna need 5%, so we'll have to work that out as well, which again, we'll work out in just a second. And then we're gonna to need to get to 45%. So in terms of what I'm gonna actually need here, I'm gonna need four lots of the 10% and one of the 5%. Four lots of 10 would be 40%, one of the fives is 5%, so combine there, that's gonna give us our 45%. So let's work out our 10%. Now we've got 64, so to get 10%, divide it by 10, so hop the decimal in, and we get 6.4. So our 10% here is gonna be 6.4. And again, we're gonna to wanna to halve that for 5%. And again, if you are struggling to halve these numbers at any point, don't forget, you can always just divide it by two using bus stop just to the side if you need to. Two goes into six three times. Keep your decimal point in place, and two goes into four twice, so 3.2. And there we go, 5% is gonna equal 3.2. So we want four of those 6.4s and we want one of the 3.2s. And now again, you could multiply 6.4 by four, or you could just add them all together using column addition. So we want four of those. Again, if we go beyond 40%, you've probably got quite a few there and you probably wanna multiply them instead, but not too difficult for us to just add those together. So what do we get? Four, eight, 12, 16 plus the two, is 18, so carry the one, and then six, 12, 18, 24, 27, plus the one is 28, so we get 28.8, and there we go, there is our final answer, and that is 45% of 64. Again, just being very careful when you do that, obviously I've added them together quite quickly, so take your time with it, but just as I said before as well, you could actually have just done 6.4 and multiplied it by 4 instead if you prefer to use a multiplication method, but if you are going to do that, don't forget to take the decimal out before you multiply, so we would have instead done 64 times 4, and then hopped the decimal in at the end, and then added the extra 3.2. So arguably that might be a little bit longer than just adding it together. I think if you just add them together, it's pretty quick and everybody's normally pretty happy to do column addition. Okay, slightly different question here. It says write down the value of, and then we've got five to the power of seven times five to the power of negative three, all divided by five squared. So write down the value. Now value doesn't mean to write it as a power, so we're not gonna have it as something like five to the power of something. We don't know what that power is, but instead we're gonna write down what the actual value is. So if it came out as five cubed, for example, we wouldn't write it as five cubed, we'd work out five times five times five, which would be 125. So 125 would be the value if this question did come out as five cubed, but let's have a look and see what it actually comes out as. So we've got a little bit of extra stuff going on here as well. You might have noticed there's a negative power on the top there, negative three, but we're gonna just deal with it in the same way as we would with normal numbers here. So on the top, I'm gonna to tidy that up, and we've got five to the power of, I'm gonna do the working out to the side here because we're gonna add these powers together. Now the first power is seven, and I'm gonna to add to that the second power, which is negative three. So I'm just gonna follow my normal number rules here. When we've got adding a negative, that's the same as taking away, so we've got seven take away three to do, and seven take away three is four. So on the top there, I'm gonna have five to the power of four. Okay, so when you've got negative powers here, don't forget just to write it out as a little sum to the side so you can see what's going on and take that out of your head. And we're gonna divide that by five squared. And again, now we're doing a division. We've got five to the power of four on the top, take away five to the power of two, so four take away two, it leaves us with two. 
So our final answer there is five to the power of two, but it did say to write down the value of this. So five squared, we just need to work that out. Five squared means five times five, and five times five is 25. So that is our value there of this um, five squared that we've got. Right, I've got some of these for you to have a go at. Don't forget just to apply your normal rules with, with your numbers. Um, one thing that could also happen, which I'm not going to go over on this particular one, is we could have had a negative power on the bottom. So let's just think about this to the side, how that would actually work out. Let's just make one up. So something like 5 squared times 5 to the power of 4. And let's imagine we have 5 to the power of negative 3 on the bottom. Now we'd still tidy up the top. We'd get 5 to the power of 6 on the top divided by 5 to the power of negative 3 on the bottom. Now this time when we subtract, the sum we'll do for that power on the bottom is the 6 on the top, and we're going to take away the power on the bottom, which is negative 3. So just thinking about that to the side, 6 take away negative 3 becomes a plus here, and 6 plus 3 is 9. So actually we would end up with 5 to the power of 9 for this particular one. Okay, so just be thinking about your numbers, depending on what comes up on the top and the bottom in those powers and where those negative powers are, if they are there. Okay, so write down the value of 4 to the power of negative 2. Now the negative part is still going to do the same thing, so we're still going to do the reciprocal. So 4 again is not a fraction, so we'll write it as 4 over 1, and the reciprocal of that is 1 over 4. Now this actually has a negative 2 in there, so that 2 is just a normal power. Okay, so the 2 is just a normal power of 2, and when we do a power of 2 we square what we've got. So when we're squaring a fraction, we are just going to square it like we would a normal number, it's that we're going to square the top, and we're going to square the bottom. So the square of 1, 1 squared, 1 times 1 is still 1, and the square of 4, 4 times 4 is 16. So there's our final answer, 1 over 16. So a negative power flips it over, the number is just a normal power. Okay, so 64 to the power of a half. Now when it comes to these fractional powers, I like to think of that little divide symbol in the power, the, the line, as like ground level. Now this little bit underneath the ground level, I kind of always like to link this back to like a plant, the bit of the plant which is underneath the ground is the root. So that number underneath there asks us to do the root. And 2 represents a square root. Okay, so 2 is a 2, a, a two root or a, two, or a square root. So we're going to do the square root of 64. So the square root of 64 is 8. There we go, so our answer is 8. There's a 1 on the top. And a 1 on the top is just the normal power, so the number on the top is the normal power. There we go, let's write that in, the normal power. So if we increase that to something else, we'd have to think about doing a power here as well. But we've just got 1 over 2, which is a normal power of 1 on the top, but a square root on the bottom. OK, so a slightly different number. We've got a small number here. We've got 0 0.00345. So it's only going to be one ever so small change in this one, and we'll have a look at what that is. So to make this a number between 1 and 10, we've got to hop the other way this time. We've got to hop that decimal one, two, three places to make it 3.45. It's still going to be times 10, but we can't have a number here that's positive because times in that by 10 would make it larger times it by 10 squared again would make it larger so to indicate the fact that this is a little number a small number we're going to have, still have a look at how many jumps we've done there but we're just going to put our power as a negative so negative three for those three hops and that just indicates there that it's a small number it's less than one and we're going to have to hop it the other way to actually find out what that is so that is 3.45 times 10 to the negative three when it's a small number okay so that is important there when it is a small number, a naught point number, it is going to have a negative power. But let's have a look at one more before we have a go. Okay, so a bigger number here, 504,000 in standard form. So there isn't a decimal in this number at the moment, but the decimal would be here at the end if we had one. So if we think about where that decimal would be if we were to write it, to write this in standard form, we'd have to do quite a few hops here. So one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so that's five hops for this number. And that would make the number 5.04. Okay, not forgetting that that four exists, we can't just uh, not include that, it's still there. So 5.04, still times 10, and that was five hops. It's a big number, so five. Okay, not a negative power for this one because it's not a naught point number, it's a large number. So 5.04 times 10 to the power of five. So just remember, if it's a large number, you're going to have a positive power with however many hops you've done to make it between 1 and 10. And if it's a naught point number, you're going to have a negative power again for however many hops you've done to make that number between 1 and 10. 
OK, write 3.4 times 10 to the 4 as an ordinary number. So going back the other way this time, an ordinary number is just an ordinary number like we were writing down before, but we've been given this in standard form. So I'm going to write this down. What we've got, we've got is 3.4. Now, it's asking us to do times 10 to the power of 4. So we know it's going to be a big number and not a little number because it's a positive power. And that 4 is going to represent 4 jumps or 4 hops. So let's hop this out 4 places, making it a bigger number. So to the right, 1, 2, three, four. So underneath all of these little loops, I just need to tidy this up and put those zeros back in because my decimal would end up just there. So that's my working out. Let's write this out nice and neat. So we've got three, four, zero, zero, zero. So 34,000. And that's what this is as an ordinary number. Let's have a look at another one. Okay, 8.03 times 10 to the minus 5. So it's a negative 5 there in the power, so it's going to be a 0 point number. So I'm going to have to hop it the other way this time. So let's write out what we've got so far. We've got 8.03. So the decimal is already in, drawn in for us. It's just in there. So we're going to hop it from there to the left to make sure it's that 0 point number because it's a negative 5 as the power. And we're going to do 5 hops. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then let's fill in these zeros and put that decimal in there where it's gonna go now. Now we've got this number here, obviously we just need to tidy this up because we would normally write this with a zero at the front, so tidy that up with a zero, and let's rewrite actually what we've got here. So we've got 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then 803. And that is my final answer there for writing that as an ordinary number. So just remember, if it's a positive power, we're gonna hop it to the right to make sure it's a big number. And if it's a negative power, we're gonna hop it to the left to make sure it's a 0 point number, a little number there. So 4.3 times 10 to the minus five times three times 10 squared, again, giving your answer in standard form. So we can apply the same little trick again. We've got 4.3 times three. If you've not got a calculator here, we could just, we could just add together three 4.3s. We're timesing it by three, so 4.3, 4.3, and another 4.3, 369, and then 4.812, so we get 12.9. So 4.3 times three is 12.9, times 10, and let's figure out what that power is gonna be. So that first power is negative five, and we're gonna add two to that. So negative five, add two, is negative three. So my power there is gonna be negative three. Again, it's not in standard form though, so I'm gonna to have to balance it out. So I'm gonna make the number one jump smaller, down to 1.29. I'm gonna make the power one jump bigger. So bigger than one bigger than negative three is negative two, getting closer to zero there. So there's our final answer. Just following the same process, building it up in difficulty, we did 4.3 times three. I used a little bit of working out to the side, which is absolutely fine to do. And then we balanced it out, so we made the number at the start one place value smaller, balanced it with making the power one jump bigger. Just watch out there when it is a negative power there, making it one bigger would not go down to negative four, that would be going smaller, so we are going up to negative two to make it bigger. So we've got the same process here, except we're doing a divide, so have a look, we've got eight times ten to the seven divided by four times ten to the three. Again, giving our answer in standard form. So all I'm going to do this time is rather than multiplying these numbers, I'm going to divide them. So eight divided by four is two, and we've got times 10 to the power of them, because we're doing a divide here, and when we've got the same base numbers and we're dividing, we subtract the powers. So seven, take away three, you can write this to the side, equals four. So two times 10 to the four. Uh, we've got three root, right, three root 20 in the form k root five, where k is an integer. Now I didn't mention it on the previous one, but it is good to note, particularly when questions are written like this, that there is a good little hint here in the question. It says write it in the form k root five. So on that previous question, we would have seen that actually having that larger root there was wrong, purely because you know it's not in the form that the question is actually asking. So for this question here, three root 20, uh, we're gonna treat it in a very similar way, but we're actually gonna ignore to start with that the three's there. I mean, it's important because it's three lots of root 20. Okay, and we can write it in that way. We can write it's three lots of root 20. But this root 20 part of the third, we are gonna to have to simplify. So we're gonna come back and remember that the three's there later, but to start with, we're just gonna treat this root 20 part in exactly the same way that we did before. So thinking about the square numbers that go in, and you might be able to spot them in your head, but I'm gonna keep writing them down, one, four, nine, 16. Uh, four goes into root 20. So just the root 20 part can be written as the square root of four multiplied by the square root of five. Okay, root four is two, so it's two lots of root five, which is two root five. 
So this is the part where we have to now just remember that there was a three there originally. It was three lots of root 20. We've now figured out that root 20 is the same as two root five. So we just have to bring this three back down and it's three lots of two root five. So again, I'm gonna link it back to algebra. If we had something like three lots of two y, and that would become six y. I'm gonna use that same logic here. Three lots of two root five becomes six root five. Okay, so there is our final answer, six root five. So, slightly different wording here. Write root 27 plus root 48 in the form a root three, where a is an integer. Now, I quite like the upper further this wording because it gives us this little hint here that we're gonna get a little root three. So straight away, I can think, well, three times something must make 27. That something must be a square number and it's three times nine or nine times three. So root 27 is root nine times root three. Root nine is three. So it's three lots of root three or three root three. Same process for 48. I know it divides by four though, but it's not four times three. So there must be a bigger square number. And that's why I quite like this root three being in the question there. It gives me a little hint there's a bigger one. So three times 16 is 48. So four to root 48 is root 16 times root three. Root 16 is four. So it's four lots of root three, which is four root three. And we're adding those together. Three lots of root three, add four lots of root three. Well, three plus four is seven. So it's seven lots of root three. And there we go, there's that one. So this first one says on the grid, draw the graph of y equals two x plus one. Now there's lots of ways of doing this, uh, but essentially it's just about understanding what this actual line equation means here. So we know hopefully that all line equations need to be in this form y equals mx plus c. Okay, so y equals mx plus c. Again, in this line equation, m represents the gradient, which in our line equation here is the number two, so we have a gradient of two, and c at the end there represents the y-intercept, which for us here is positive one, so we've got a y-intercept of positive one. Now, in terms of what that means the graph's gonna look like, we know it's gonna cross through positive one on the y-intercept, which is right here. There we go, I'll try and mark that on, there we go. So we know the line's gonna go through this point. And all we have to do is figure out where all the rest of the coordinates are. Now in terms of y equals 2x plus 1, remember x and y relate to the x and y coordinate. So all, the, all that this equation actually means is to find the y coordinate, you do 2 times the x coordinate and add 1, or double the x coordinate and add 1. So all we need to do is actually pick some x coordinates. Now if you have a look on the graph, you can see there's lots of x coordinates here. We've got minus 1, 0, 1, 2, three and four at the end there. Okay, so all we have to actually do is pick them, double them and add one, and that'll tell us where the corresponding y coordinate is. And we can do that using a little table. Now, you don't have to use a table, but it, it just, just tidy it up a little bit if we just make a little table here. Sometimes you'll be given the table, but it's quite unlikely that you'll be given it. So we've got some x coordinates and we've got some y coordinates we need to find. Now for x, we've got starting at minus one, and then it goes zero, and then we've got up to four, so one, two, three. Four. So if we start with uh, negative one, this one here, we need to double that and add one. Now I'm gonna just sub that into my little equation up there. So y equals two x plus one. So it's two lots of minus one, two times minus one, and then add one. And if we double negative one, we get negative two. Add one to that gives us negative one. So our first y coordinate there is negative one as well. So minus one, minus one. And we can plot that if we want straight away. There it is, minus one, minus one. Moving on to the next one. Um, what, we, what do we have for this next one? We have uh, the y cut, the x coordinate of zero. So if we just, without doing all the working out for all of these, let's double zero is zero and add one is one. So two times zero is zero, add one is one. And if we carry on doing this for the next one, so when x is one, double one is um, two and then add one is three. So double one is two, add one is three. And you can start to see there's a little bit of a pattern emerging. Okay, between all of these points, if you have a look from minus one to one, that is adding two. From one to three, that's also adding two. So actually all we need to actually do is keep adding two. So add two to three is five, add two again is seven, and add two again is nine. And then we can go ahead and plot as many of these as we can. Obviously we can't do them all here um, because the graph's not big enough. But for the next one, let's have a look. One to three is there, and two and five is there. 
Okay, so they're, they're all the points we can plot. We could actually only plot it up to this point here. Um, but once we've done that, all you need to do is grab a pencil, grab a ruler, and join it up nice and straight all the way through the graph, unless it states otherwise. So with your ruler, nice straight line going all the way through and extending it up to the edge of the graph there. There you go, and that is your line. And it's always good practice just to label it. You don't have to, okay, but you could just label that as the line y equals 2x plus 1. It just helps if there are multiple graphs or multiple lines on the graph, but you don't have to label it unless you're asked to. Okay, but there you go, y equals 2x plus 1. There are other ways of drawing this, and it just comes to having an understanding of the equation there. So we already talked about one of them, the fact that it starts on the y-intercept at plus 1, and then the fact that it has a gradient of 2 just means that for every step across from a point on the line, so if we look at this as, I know it's two squares there, you've got to be careful of the um, careful of the scale, but that's one across going from 0 to 1, and if you have a look it goes up from 1 to 3. There you go, so it has a, a rise there of going up 2 for every 1. And you can always draw this in, it's a way of understanding it as well, so it's 2 there and one here, every one across it goes up two, and that's what a gradient of two actually means. It means for every one step across, it goes up two steps, even though the scale's slightly different here. It's one in terms of the numbers across and two in terms of the numbers going up, and that is what a gradient of two actually represents. But it's best bet is just to draw the little table out uh, and then get all your numbers nice and neatly drawn in. Okay, so in this question we are given an, a line already drawn on a graph, and it says write down the equation of the line. Now we know already that what the equation of a line is going to look like, it's in this format, y equals mx plus c. Again, that c being the y-intercept. Now we can see the y-intercept on the graph, it's over here, 5. So for starters, I can actually just draw that straight in. We can say c equals 5, and we can just put that in our line equation, so y equals mx plus 5. All we need to figure out is what the gradient is. Now if we have a look at this question, well, we've got to find some coordinates that we can actually see. So here's another coordinate that's on the line, 1, 3. Now if I want to find the gradient between these two points, all I have to do is draw a little right angle triangle in. So I can go across or down from this red point, but if I go across and then down, I'm just going to say how big the uh, movement is there. So that's a movement of 1 there, and then that's going down 2, so I'm going to say that that's negative 2. Now the equation to get the gradient, there's two different ways that you can look at it. You can have a look at it and it's just use this little triangle, it means the change in. So it's the change in the y coordinate over the change in the x coordinate. And it's sometimes referred to as rise over run. Okay, so you might know one of these two. But change in y over change in x or rise over run. Now in this case, look, the change in the y coordinate is this movement here going down, it's minus two. So that'll be on the top of my little fraction here, minus 2. And the run, or the change in x, is on the bottom there, is the 1 going across. So it's minus 2 over 1. And minus 2 divided by 1 is negative 2. Okay, so my gradient here is negative 2. So it's obviously sloping downwards, which is why it's got a negative gradient. But that's um, what our gradient actually is for this question here. So all I've got to do is put negative 2 in place of m and we get y equals minus 2x plus 5. Obviously thinking about that last question that we looked at, you could actually write that as 5 minus 2x, but you can write it in either way, it's absolutely fine to do so. Just a little side note, you can actually do these triangles as big as you want. If I picked some different coordinates, let's have a look, that one there, and this one here for example, and if I was to go down instead and make a big triangle like this, let's have a look, my run there is 4, and my rise goes from 7 down to negative 1, which is a movement of minus 8. And if I did rise over run for this one, or the change in y over change in x, it would be minus 8 over 4, and minus 8 divided by 4 is minus 2. So you can do this however you like, okay, because it's a straight line, it doesn't actually matter where you do the gradient from, it's just you just need to draw it and read those numbers very, very carefully so you can get the correct gradient there. Okay, so solving 4x plus 2 all over 5 equals 6. Now same process again, it's all locked in by this denominator which is dividing by 5. So the first thing I'm going to do is times both sides by 5 to remove that divide. Now again, it's not going to change the top there, we're just removing a divide. So 4x plus 2 equals 6 times 5 which is 30. And now as you can see, it looks very similar to the question that we had before. And we're just gonna follow the same approach now to solve it. So it's a plus two, so we're gonna minus two. So we take away two from both sides, and we get four x equals 28. 
and then just like before, dividing it by 4, and that gives us x equals 7. There we go, and there's our final answer. Okay, so 2x minus 2 equals 7x plus 8. Now this time the smaller value of x is on the left hand side. That's fine though, we'll just get rid of 2x okay on both sides and we'll see what we've got now when we do this you've got to be careful because this is negative 2 which is going to be left here so that's going to be negative 2 on the left and it equals 5x when we take away the 2 plus 8 okay so we've got the x's on the right hand side so we want to get rid of this plus 8 so to get rid of a positive 8 there we're going to subtract 8 and do that from both sides negative 2 take away 8 is negative 10 so negative 10 equals 5x and then finish it off just like normal, we're going to divide by 5, so divide by 5, negative 10 divided by 5 is negative 2, so negative 2 equals x, okay, and it doesn't matter which way it's written around, we can just rewrite that if you want, x equals negative 2, and there's our final answer there. So we can have fractions, we can have negative numbers, we can have whole numbers, okay, but ultimately we just need to make sure we get the x's on one side, the numbers on the other, and then just make sure we solve it just like a normal equation there. Okay, so when looking at an identity, there could be anything involved here. We could have expanding brackets, we could have factorising, we could have any sort of simplification using algebra. Now this particular identity that we have here involves an algebraic fraction. Now what we've got is we have ax squared plus 11x plus b all over x plus 4 is always equal to 2x plus 3. Find the values of a and b. Now if we think about an algebraic fraction, we know that therefore on the top there must have been an x plus 4 when that quadratic there is factorised. That's the only way that the x plus 4s would cancel off and we'd just be left with the 2x plus 3. So if we think about writing this algebraic fraction, we have x plus 4 on the bottom, there would have to be another x plus 4 on the top, because that would allow us to cancel off both of those, so let's just imagine they're already cancelled off. And therefore, all that would be left on the top would have to be 2x plus 3. So if we imagine that 2x plus 3 is there, then therefore that would be equal to our 2x plus 3 that it says it's always equal to in the question. So therefore, we know the double bracket that has to be on the top there. We've got x plus 4 and 2x plus 3. Now this question is asking us to find the values of a and b, which is our number at the end there, and our number in front of the x squared. So if we go about expanding that double bracket, then we should be able to find both those values. So if we write that down, we have x plus 4, and we need to expand that with 2x plus 3. So if we go about expanding that, we have x times 2x, which is going to be equal to 2x squared, and there is our value of a, that's going to be the 2. Then we have the x times the 3, which gives us plus 3x. We have the 4 times the 2x, which gives us plus 8x. And we have the 4 times the 3, which would give us plus 12 at the end, and that plus 12 there is going to be our value of b. Now we'll write this, just make sure it does match at the top, so that gives us 2x squared. When we add together these two x values, we get plus 11x, and we still have the plus 12 at the end. So there we go, we've got our value of a, which is 2, and our value of b, which is 12. So we would just write that down, a is equal to 2, and b is going to be equal to to 12 and that would be our final answer. So when it comes to an identity you're normally just simplifying or doing some sort of algebra but it's just showing you exactly what the answer is going to be already and you've just got to kind of work around it in reverse or just figure out what's on that left hand side. So when we're simplifying an algebraic fraction we're looking for a common factor on the top and the bottom. And when it comes to algebra to find a factor in algebra we can factorise to find a factor. So if we have a look at the top and we just need to factorise both of these. Now the expression on the top there has an x in both so we can factorise this by x. No numbers in both but we can factorise it by x. So if we take x out the bracket we would have x and then inside the bracket we'll have x minus sorry plus 5. Okay, x plus 5. If we do the same on the bottom, we've got a quadratic on the bottom, so you need to know how to factorise quadratics here. Uh, but we've got 1 and 10, or 2 and 5 as our options to go in our double bracket. And in order to make 7 there in the middle, we want plus 2 and plus 5. And here we go, x plus 2 and x plus 5. There is a little bit of a hint there in terms of the factors we'd be using, because obviously we had x plus 5 on the top, but it's not always going to be the case that we'll get that, but obviously so we still need to be able to factorise, but there is a little bit of a hint there that there was going to be an x plus 5 in one of the brackets. Now there's an x plus 5 on the top and the bottom, so essentially what we can do is we can divide the top and the bottom by x plus 5, which would cancel out these brackets here. And if we cancel them out, we just need to write what's left. 
we have x on the top and on the bottom we have the x plus 2 which you can either put in the brackets or leave without the brackets it doesn't matter there but our final answer is x over x plus 2. Okay so something slightly different here we've still got the same first step so we still need to square both sides to start with so we get y squared equals 3x minus 5 over 4 now we can unlock the fraction so times both sides by 4 and we get 4y squared equals 3x minus 5 now we can add the 5 to both sides so plus 5 and we get 4y squared plus 5 equals 3x and then finishing this off for the final step we can divide by 3 we're going to get a big fraction here we get 4y squared plus 5 all over 3 equals x brilliant and there's the last one now this isn't that much harder this question it's just that there's a bracket involved now don't forget whenever you see a bracket we're just going to get rid of it and rewrite it without the bracket so let's just completely rewrite this but get rid of the bracket we've got 4x minus y equals and once we expand that we get zx plus 5z Okay, so now we just need to get the x's on the same side. This time I'm going to move the x's to the left. I'm just having a look at this minus y here and just thinking, well, if I add that over, it's going to get rid of that negative symbol there. But again, there are two ways of doing it. But I'm just going to move the x to the left-hand side this time. So if we move that piece, we have 4x minus y minus this zy, zx, sorry, which we're getting over to the left. So minus zx, and that now equals 5z. Now add that y over and that will just leave the x's on their own on that left hand side so add y to both sides and we get 4x minus that z, zx equals 5z add y now we can do the same thing again we can factorize this left hand side so what's on the left here i'm going to factorize that let's do it up here to the side so factorizing it by x gives us x brackets 4 minus z and that equals 5z plus y. There you go, 5z plus y. So finishing this question off now, same process again, I'm just going to divide by this bracket, so this 4 minus z, and divide by 4 minus z, and it will just go underneath as a fraction, so we'll have x equals 5z plus y over 4 minus z. You could leave it in a bracket in the bottom, but we can get rid of that now because we don't actually need the bracket there anymore. But that's our final answer. Okay, so a little technique for this as well is I always do spot the ones that I like to start with. Uh, and I have straight away, I don't know why I looked at this one first, but I straight away look, looked at that reciprocal graph and I know that that one's got to be that one there. So that's C for that one. C is, uh, is C. The next one that seems quite obvious to me is the X squared graph. Okay, so that one's there. So that's going to be B. Uh, we've got then two linear graphs here. So we've got not a quadratic cubic or a reciprocal, but we've got linear graphs. So that uh, question B there, if you have a look, the gradient is minus two. So that's got a negative gradient. And here the gradient is positive two. So obviously with a negative gradient, it'll be sloping down. Positive gradient, it'll be sloping up. So let's just apply that logic there. So this one is going to be graph D. And this one here is our only one left, which is going to be graph A. There we go. So obviously just a little bit of a process of elimination there. Uh, once you've got the ones that you like, then you can have a look at the ones that maybe you're not too keen on. But to be honest, those, those straight line equations, those linear graphs, they're actually quite nice. Okay, so this question here is slightly trickier. Our equation is y equals x squared minus 5x plus 3, and we've got the values from negative 1 to 5. Now, it's that negative 1 there that we're going to make a mistake on if we do make a mistake, so we've just got to be extra careful with that. So thinking about our little brackets, we're going to put minus 1 in a bracket, and that's going to be squared. Take away, well, then we've got 5 lots of another x, so another negative 1 goes in there, and then we're going to add 3. I'm just going to be really careful with your numbers here as you go about working this out. Negative 1 squared is negative 1 times negative 1, which gives us plus 1 or positive 1. Then we've got minus 5 times minus 1, and that gives us positive 5. So you've just got to be careful there when you do this. And then we're going to add 3. So actually when you're looking at the sum's not too bad, but that little bit there, that minus 5, minus 1, just got to be very careful. If you do do 5 times minus 1 and get the minus 5, you just got to remember it's you're actually taking away that minus 5. And take away negative 5 gives us the plus 5 that we've got below there. So 1 plus 5 is 6, plus 3 is 9. So there we go, that's our value in there, 9. 
Then we can go about working out the others. The others aren't so bad because without those negatives, we've got two squared. And again, I'll write the working out for down for this last one. Two squared, take away five lots of two. There you go, putting the two in again, and then adding three. So two squared is four. Then we're gonna take away 10, it's minus five times two, so take away 10, and then add three. And that leaves us with nine. Four take away 10 is minus six, add, th sorry. Four take away 10 is minus six, add three. Oh, I don't know what I was saying there. Uh, that is gonna leave us not with nine. Four take away 10 is minus six, add the three is minus three. And there we go, so we get minus three there. And then our last value, I better write this down after I just said that. Uh, let's go for this, we've got four squared, take away four, Five lots of four, which is 20, and then plus three. So let's get rid of that four squared, let's write 16. So we've got 16, take away 20, which is minus four, add the three is minus one. And again, you can see a little bit of a pattern. Look, we've got two minus threes in the middle, then the minus one either side, a three either side of that, and we've got the extra nine going on at the end there. Let's get rid of those and let's plot this on the graph. So we've got negative one to nine, which is there, zero to three, there, one to negative one, as best I can there, and always look out for the scale on these. If you can see on this one, the y-axis scale, the numbers are a bit closer than on the x-axis, so do watch out for that. Two minus three is down here, I can just about get that. Three minus three is there, four minus one is here, and then we've got five, three, which is there. And again, a nice smooth curve using a pencil as best you can, making sure it goes through all the points. There we go, I've just about managed to get that. This one here, I would say that one's not very good there. It does need to make sure it's perfectly going through the point. Uh, but there we go, that gives you the general idea of how to go about actually drawing these quadratic graphs. Okay, so we've reciprocal graph. There we go, so we've got our line equation here. It's y equals four over x. So this is what forms a reciprocal graph. This is when you've got a number getting divided by the x there, and it forms a particularly different looking graph as well. So this is called reciprocal, and let's just have a go at filling these numbers in the tables and seeing what we get. Now I actually think these are probably one of the easiest ones to plot, but they do normally tend to just throw people a little bit, particularly if they haven't seen one. Um, so let's just have a think about what this actually makes here. So we've got four divided by x, so we've got four divided by 0 0.5, and there we go. Obviously if you don't have a calculator here, there's a couple of little tricks you can do to figure that out, but dividing by a half just doubles the number. If you think about logically, one what a half fits into one twice, it doubles the one, it makes the one two. So if we do four divided by a half, we get eight. And again, you can check that on the calculator, but it just doubles the number there. The next one along, we've got four divided by four here. And four divided by four is one. Here, we've got four divided by five. Not very nice. Four divided by five is four fifths. One fifth is 0 0.2, so that's 0 0.8. It is quite pop most likely you would have this using a calculator, but obviously just quite a nice one if we didn't have a calculator and thinking about how we'd approach that. And the last one here, we've got four over eight. Four over eight simplifies as a fraction, it's one half. So write that as a decimal, 0 0.5. There we go. So we've got some slightly different values here. You'll see it starts off at eight and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller as we sort of increase the number there. And obviously think about the logic behind why that happens. We've got four dividing by a number. If we divide that by a small number like 0 0.5, we get a large answer. Divide it by a big number, obviously, or just an increasing number, that's gonna make our answer smaller and smaller. So if we actually go about plotting this, we've got 0 0.5 down the bottom all the way up to eight, that is there. We've got one that goes to four. We've got two that goes to two. 3 goes to, we don't have 3, so we can't do that, 4 to 1, 5 we've got, 0.8, I'm trying to do this as best as I can, 4 little squares up, and then we've got 8, which is 0 0.5, and that's there. Right, so joining this up, uh, what we get is, and I'll try and do this as best as I can, a nice smooth curve again, we just get this sort of, there we go, there we are. And we get that is what a reciprocal graph looks like. Now what we don't have is a full four quadrant graph here, but if we did, our bit that we've drawn would go in here. And if we actually looked at the negative element of this graph, so subbing in some of the negatives, like if you imagine we put minus 0 0.5 in, minus 0 0.5 would give us minus eight, which would be down here. And the rest of the graph would then form that same pattern going this way. There we go. 
There we are. So obviously it's not asked us to draw that negative part for this particular graph here, and it very rarely actually does because it's actually quite complicated, obviously, to have a four quadrant graph and draw all of those elements. But there's something a bit strange that happens in a reciprocal graph. Obviously, we've got two different lines there. We've got the positive element over here, which we've drawn on our graph, and you can also have the negative element over here, but they don't actually join up. And if you think about the logic there, that's because if we put this point here in the origin, we would end up with four divided by zero. And four, dividing by zero is obviously an impossibility in maths. We can't actually divide by zero. It doesn't make any sense. So we can't actually do that. We can't actually get a value for zero. And because of that, it sort of jumps uh, away from the origin and actually never touches the axes there. You think no matter what number we put in, we're never going to get a value of zero. We can keep making zero smaller and smaller and smaller, but we'll just get a bigger answer for y. We can keep making x larger and larger, but again, we'll just get a smaller value of y, and it'll never actually hit zero. So these sorts of graphs here never actually touch the axes, um, but there we go. That's what sort of defines a little, just a little bit to do with this graph here so you understand why it looks the way it looks. Okay, so in this graph again, it's a speed time graph. We're going to again treat it in the same way as if it said velocity time, uh, but but it's, it's sloping in a different sort of direction this time. So we're going to get some, a slightly different answer in the final part here, but we'll have a look at how that happens. So it says, here is a speed time graph for a car. Work out an estimate for the distance travelled by the car in the first 10 seconds, and this time use five strips of equal width. And it says, is your answer an underestimate or an overestimate, and explain why. So like we are explaining on our last question there, we'll have a look at what happens in, in the case of this shape here. So we're going to do five equal strips from naught to 10. So we're going to finish off uh, over at the 10 there. Let's just highlight that just so we don't go past it by accident. So there's the 10, that's where we're going to finish. So five strips of equal width, each one could be a width of two then. So let's start splitting this up. So we've got two, four, six, eight, and 10 finishing up there. And if we connect these all up from zero as our starting point up to there, we get a little triangle. On our next one, look, we get a nice trapezium again. We get a trapezium on the next one, another trapezium there, and a final trapezium there, there we go. Drawing those in as best as you can using a ruler and a pencil. So again, we can label these up. Rather than label them, I'm just gonna do them from, from one to five across. So I'm gonna do the triangle to start with. So the triangle, let's have a look. Let's just write in all these lengths again. I was encourage you to do this. They've all got a base of two, which is quite nice. So we can put all of those in. We just need to get all these heights worked out. So the height of that triangle, I'm getting, let's have a look. Every two squares is one. It goes up 10 squares up to five. So every square is a half. So let's have a look. That first one to me looks like it's about four squares. So that's a height of two. The next one looks like it hits five, so height of five. Then we've got a height of, I'm gonna to have to be a little bit careful when I count these, a height of nine on the next one. Again, you might get ever so slightly different to me. You will be allowed a range here, just depending on obviously reading those as accurately as you can. And the next one looks like a height of 14 to me, although I can't see it very well underneath my pen. I'll probably have to get rid of that if I wanna see it perfectly. Maybe it's 15 actually, I think that's a height of 15. There we go, we'll go for 15. If obviously, if you've got that slightly different on the paper, then that's fine. And the very last one there, and again, I've not drawn the line in perfectly, but it looks like that's 24 to me. There we go, 24. So again, not too much stress here if you're getting slightly different numbers. Obviously, you'll be able to see this a lot more accurately than me. Right, so let's work this out then. I'm going to start off with the triangle. Now, I've not got a huge amount of space. So let's go for a different colour. We might be able to see a bit better. So number one, that triangle there. So we've got base times height divided by two. So we've got two times two which is four divided by two, which is two. So let's have a look. And again, this is in meters per second. So our units are gonna be meters. So we've got two meters there for the first one. The second one, we've got that, that second trapezium. It's got um, the parallel lengths of two and five. So add together the parallel sides, two plus five divided by two. And because the width or the height is two there, we're gonna times it by two. So these are actually the, probably the best ones to come up here when the when the base there or the height of the trapezium is two, because you don't have to bother dividing and timesing by two because it's the same thing. So it's just two plus five, which is seven. There we go. So I'm gonna use a little bit of a trick now, rather than dividing by two and timesing by two and writing all that working out, I'm just gonna to add together those, uh, those heights there or the parallel sides, whichever way we look at it. So there we go, we've got the next one which is 5 plus 9, and you've got to be very careful because you can obviously only ever apply that trick if it is uh, a height between those sides of 2 or a base of 2, but as it is, let's go with that little trick. So 5 plus 9 is 14, so 14 metres. The next one, number 4, we've got 9 plus 15, there we go, which is 24 metres. And the final one here, our fifth strip there, is 15 plus 24. 
there we go and 39 meters and again I just want to reiterate obviously just be very careful applying that trick it is purely because each of these lengths down here are two that we're able to do that little trick there and just be very very careful because obviously we started off with a triangle there so we had a slightly different formula for working the area that out. obviously it's half base times height so we've got two times two divided by two we could have done one times two just half the base that's fine so there we go we've got all of our distances there we've got two seven fourteen twenty four and thirty nine and we need to add those all together to get our total distance so i'm just going to do that on a calculator two plus seven plus fourteen plus twenty four plus 39 and we add those all together and we get 86 meters there we go as our final answer and again obviously I've got meters there from our axes with where it says meters per second right so there we go that is the end of that question we have got a little bit left to think about and that is obviously whether it is an under or overestimate now for the the starting pieces so it's quite hard to see you can almost see a little bit of a gap there and a slightly bigger one here. I didn't draw it in very well, but because obviously the curve is sloping in a slightly different way, our shape's actually going over the top of the line there. So we would say this is an overestimate. There we go. As based on the shapes that we have used, our shape is including an, an additional area above the curve there that actually isn't going to be included in the real distance. So we've got a slightly overestimate purely because we've got a little bit slightly slightly larger area than we actually than we actually should get if we were to draw that perfectly under the curve. Right, okay, so three more here. On the grid, shade the region that satisfies these inequalities. So for the first one, we've got y is less than 3x, or y equals 3x is the one we're going to plot. So that doesn't have a y-intercept, so that y-intercept is going to be zero. I should be careful with my language there. It does have a y-intercept, it's just that it's not a whole number there. We've just got the zero as the y-intercept. So we're going to start at zero. It's got a gradient of three. So I'm going to go across one, up three, across one, up three. I'm going to follow that pattern going backwards. So left one, down three, left one, down three. And there we go. And that's our first line there. Y is equal to 3x. And it's going to be a dotted line. As we've not got the extra ink on the inequality, it's going to be... Uh, less than 3x there we go so let's just draw that in as best you can obviously using a ruler and a pencil now we've got the next one so y equals zero that's an interesting one y equals zero is actually the x-axis it's just another name for the x-axis so we can go across here that's the line going through all the points where x equals zero sorry y equals zero there we go going across there's our second inequality and our last one here which isn't the nicest we've got 4x plus 3y equals 12 and we need to draw that now again one that looks a bit dodgy so i'm going to apply that same logic i'm going to go when x is zero so we've got zero plus three y equals 12 because four lots of zero is zero there so zero plus three y equals 12 well th three times the number has to equal 12 so y has to equal four for that one there we go so when x is zero y is four so we just need to find that coordinate so zero four is there and the next one let's do that the other way around so when y is 0, what's x going to have to be? So we have 4x plus 3 lots of 0, so 0 equals 12. Well, 4 times the number has to equal 12, so that has to equal 3, so x has to be 3 there. So when y is 0, x is 3, and that is there. I'll draw a bit of a bigger cross so we can actually see that. There we go. So we can draw that in, taking that logical approach there. Not the easiest one for me to draw on the screen here, so I'm going to do my best, but obviously you will have a ruler and a pencil, so all you have to do is join those two together and draw a nice straight line. There we go, going through that. Right, there we go. Obviously, I've just extended a little bit past the line, past the graph there, but that doesn't really matter. Let's get rid of that. Right, okay, so we've got a basic outline of what it would look like. Obviously, yours would be a bit more accurate here when you're using a ruler and a pencil, but that is that last line drawn. Now, you could have taken a different approach for that one again. You don't have to take this approach. Just remember, to get that into the form y equals mx plus c, we'd have to take away the 4x from both sides. So we'd have 3y equals negative 4x plus 12. And then we'd have to divide both sides by 3. So we'd end up with y equals negative 4 over 3 divided by 3, x plus 4. There we go. And you could actually plot the graph from there. Just remembering what that means. It means there's a y-intercept of 4, which we already have. And then that gradient there just means we've got a rise of 4 and a run of 3. Obviously, it's going downwards. So we could go along 3, down 4, along 3, down 4. Obviously, just reversing the idea of the gradient there. But again, obviously, if you want to look into these gradient uh, bits a little bit more and understanding these line equations, do check out those videos in the description and look at that coordinate geometry series. That's going to really help with understanding that. But there we go. I like quite like just taking the logical approach and imagining one of the coordinates is zero and finding the other coordinate that matches and then just joining them up with a ruler. It does work for all of these. Right, so let's get rid of all of these. We need to find our region then. So let's have a look. Now we've got a nice little coordinate inside. We've got one, one there. So let's go for that inside the triangle. See if it works. 
So 1, 1 to x is 1, y is 1. So we've got 1 is less than 3 lots of 1, 1 is less than 3. Again, that's correct, so we can tick that off. The next one, we've got 1 is bigger than 0. Y is, zero, y is 1, sorry, so 1 is bigger than 0, that's correct. And on to the last one, 4 lots of 1 is 4, plus 3 lots of 1, which is 3. So 4 plus 3 is less than 12, and that's obviously 7 is less than 12, and that's correct as well. So we can tick that off, and there we go, that is our region, definitely correct there in the middle. Again, this little triangle in the inside. Right, there we go. So. That is obviously how to draw inequalities on a graph and how to find the shaded region. Okay, so this question here says find the next three terms in this Fibonacci style sequence. And as you can see, rather than numbers being our sequence, we have some expressions. So we have A and A plus B. So this is going to involve a little bit of you knowing about collecting like terms. And as I said at the start, I will include any of these videos just in case you haven't actually met some of these topics yet. But for this one here, we are going to involve some algebra. So if we have a look at the first two terms, we have a and a plus b. Now if we were to write that down as a sum, just in case you prefer to look at it like this, although I won't always do this, we would have a plus and then the a plus b. So we're going to collect these like terms. So we've got an a and we have another a. So in total that gives us 2a for our third term and we've got that b. So our third term which isn't really going to fit in that little gap there, so we're going to write it down here. That would give us 2a plus b. There we go, and that would be our third term in the sequence. And now we just need to look at those previous two terms again. So we have the a plus b, and we have the 2a plus b. So in total there we have three a's. So we're going to write for our next term here. We've got three a's. There we go, and now we've got the plus b and the plus b to get to add together, and that would give us in total two b's. So we have three a plus two b. Now following that same process again, we we're gonna look at those previous two terms. This time that's gonna be two a plus b and the three a plus two b. And again, just adding those a's together to start with. So if we look at those, we've got two a and we've got three a, and in total there, that gives us five a. And then looking at the others, Let's have a look, we've got 1b and we've got 2b. So adding those together there, that would give us plus 3b. And that would be our fifth term in the sequence. Okay, so we're just collecting like terms and treating this just like every other Fibonacci sequence, except we've got these algebraic expressions to deal with. Now it says here that a, b, c, d is a rhombus, and you can see that a to b to c to d, and completing the shape there makes our rhombus. It says that M and N are points on the line BD, such that D to M and N to B, which we can see here, D to M and N to B are equal lengths. It then says prove that triangle DMC is congruent to the triangle BNC. So if we highlight those triangles, DMC is this triangle here, and the other triangle that we are looking at is just here, BNC. So these are the two triangles that we are trying to show that are congruent. So when we're looking at congruent triangle proof, we are going to have to think about our congruent triangle rules. So again, I will link the video for that in the description if you haven't seen it already, but that is going to be very important for all of these geometric proof questions. So for the first thing then, now often something is given to us in the question. And the first line tells us that it's a rhombus. And we know that when it comes to a rhombus, all of the sides are the same length. So if we look at these two triangles, can we apply anything from that towards our proof? And the answer is yes. We have the line B to C and we have the line D to C, which are the same length as it's a rhombus. So we can actually say that as one of our first points. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bullet point them. So for my first bullet point, I am going to say that B to C is equal to D to C, and we give a reason for that. So the reason being is that sides of the rhombus are equal. Okay, so we can say sides of a rhombus are equal. There we go. Now, that, if we are doing our thinking back to our congruent triangle proof, that is a side. So you can either write that down next to it, or you can just remember that that is a side. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to put in a bracket the letter S just to remind myself that I have already proved one of the sides. 
Next look at our question. Now we were told as well in the question that d to m was equal to n to b. And that's very nice because that is one of our sides on both of those triangles. And if I highlight those with two lines, we've got this, this line here and we've also got this line here. And it says to us in the question that they are equal and that is another side within our triangles. So I would give another bullet point here and I would say d to m is equal to n to b and for that one there it's quite as simple as just saying it's given to us in the question so I would just say given in question there we go and that is also a side so that is a nice easy explanation as it is already given to us so I would just again put next to that 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 is a side Obviously, I'm going to run out of some space here, so I'm going to move my proof onto the right. Um, but let's have a look at proving something else. So we've proved two sides, and it's always normally the last one, which is the hardest to find. So we have to think about in this question, how can we find anything else? Now I'm going to get rid of what we've drawn so far so that we can ha maybe have a look at the larger picture. Because the other side doesn't look like that was very easy for us to prove. We've got that this line here will need to be equal to this line here but there's nothing in the question that actually dictates that for us. So let's have a look at maybe one of the angles. So we have this angle here and this angle here. There's no, nothing that we could use to prove that. We have this angle here and this angle here, but again, there's nothing we can use to prove that. But if we think about the larger triangle that we can see, which you can see going from here to here to here, that is actually an isosceles triangle, which we've already proved because we said that this line was the same as this one, then therefore that would have to be an isosceles. And we know that when it comes to an isosceles, the base angles are equal. So actually looking outside of this picture and, and sort of the larger triangle in the, in the picture there, we can actually determine that those angles are equal. So I could write here the angle and again, we're gonna use the three letters for that angle there. So for the bottom one, I could say MDC, angle MDC is equal to angle, and the one at the top there, I would say NBC, or any arrangement of those, as long as B is in the middle. And the reason behind that is because base angles in an isosceles are equal. Okay, so I would give my reason base angles in an isosceles are equal and that is an angle. So there we go, I have another bit of my proof, I'm gonna put that just there and that is an angle. So if we get rid of the rest of that diagram, let's have a look at what we have. So for each triangle, we proved that this side was equal, we proved that this side was equal, and we proved that the angle between them was in fact equal for both of them. So for my proof for this one, I would say, and this is the final line, and I'm just going to use this symbol for therefore, I would say therefore, and in the question it's a DMC, so triangle DMC is equal to triangle B and C, again, just getting these words from the question. Okay, and I would give my reason, and my congruent triangle proof here is side, angle, side. And I just have to put side, angle, side. But you could write some more words there. You could say because of the side, angle, side proof. So there we go, we had three points. We had the first one showing that two sides were equal, the second one showing two sides were equal, the third one there showing that angles were equal, and then we had our conclusion using the side angle side rule. So as you can see, these questions are quite tricky. People tend to find these quite difficult because you, if you actually have to really think about how to find particular sides or particular angles and thinking about all these other elements of maths, as you've seen there, thinking about rhombuses and thinking about isosceles triangles. And every question can have something different within it. Okay, so for this one, we've got a slightly different type of prism. And in this case, you would be given a little bit more information here, but it would tell you the shape of this cross section just here. Now you'll see that on the one that you practice, but for the purpose of practice, I've minimized the amount of information here. But that cross section there is a trapezium. So when we're working out this one here, we need to get the area of a trapezium. So you need to know the formula for that as well. Now with the area of a trapezium, I have a little formula that we have is A plus B, which is the two parallel sides. We need to halve, the sum of those 
and then multiply it by the height. And again, this could be written in different ways. We can have half brackets a plus b times h as well. So it doesn't matter which way you use the formula. Again, I'm just gonna use it in this way where we divide by two first. So if we look at the two parallel sides, in this case, that's the six and it's the eight. In order to get the area of the trapezium, we first add those together. So six plus eight, we're gonna divide that answer by two and we're gonna multiply it by the height between them and that's the perpendicular height. And in this case, it gives us the perpendicular height there, it's five. So we're gonna multiply our answer to that by five and that's gonna give us the area of the trapezium. So working this out then, six plus eight is 14. So we have 14 on the top divided by two and that is seven. So seven times five. So our area of that trapezium is 35, obviously centimeter squared there, but we're gonna work out the volume. So obviously now we've got the area of the cross section, how far does it go back through the shape? And we have a distance of 20 centimeters there. So to finish this off, we take the area of our cross section again, 35, we multiply it by the 20, two times 35 is 70, add on the zero, and we get 700 centimeter cubed as our final answer. So again, a lot of similarity between all of these. Again, all we did was work out the area of the cross section and then multiply it by the depth. Okay, so when it comes to a triangular prism, obviously we also have a triangular face now. So we've not just got rectangles involved, we're also gonna to have to look at these triangles. So if we label up the faces that we have, we have one triangle at the front, and we also have another triangle at the back. So that is gonna be number one, and that is the same face on the front and the back. We also have this slanted length, which is going downwards. It's kind of difficult to label them, obviously because we have uh, a see-through shape here. So we've got number two, which is the front uh, rectangle there sloping downwards. We also have the one on the back, which is another rectangle and we'll call that face number three. And we actually have one more and let's label that with another color and that is the one on the bottom and that is face number four. So one and one, they have two triangles and then we have rectangle two, rectangle three and rectangle four. Again, you can work these out in any order, but just so we can actually see them. So for number one, for the triangle, let's work that out. So to work out the area of a triangle, you have to do base times height divided by two. So that is gonna be six times eight and then divide our answer by two, or of course you could halve the base and then times it by eight. So that comes out as an answer of 24. Now, not forgetting, we also have two of those. So if we do two times 24 straight away to take into account that we have our two triangles, that's gonna give us an area of 48 for our triangles. We can then move on to one of the rectangles. So let's go with number two and let's just get the side lengths. So for that particular rectangle, we have 10 going down the slanted length there and we have nine down the bottom. So to work out the area of that, we would do nine times 10 and that gives us an area of 90. So now we've got our area of 90, let's write that down as well, and that one's finished. Now we can move on to our next rectangle, and that is the rectangle on the back. The rectangle on the back has a bottom length of nine, as you can see already highlighted, and it has a height of eight. So for that one there, we would do eight times nine, which gives us an area for that one of 72. So now we've got that one as well, we can label that. So number three is 72, and that's another area done. And then moving on to our last one, we have the length along the bottom. Again, that uses the length of nine, and it has a width of six. So for that one there, we can label this one, and we can do six times nine. There we go, which comes out as 54. And that is our final area. So for number four there, we have an area of 54. Right, so we've got all of our areas, all we need to do is add them together. So if we put them all together, we have 48, we have 90, we have 72, and we have 54. And we just need to add them all up, be very careful when you do this, so that adds up to 14. And then we've got 13, 25, 26, so that comes out as 264. So my final answer would be 264 centimetres squared and that would be the surface area of this triangular prism. So obviously just a little bit more to think about there because we had the triangular face, and then we also had three different rectangles for this particular prism. Okay, so find the exact value of tan 30 times sine 60 and give your answer in its simplest form. Now if you had a question like this, obviously we'd have to start drawing out our triangles and work out what tan 30 and sine 60 is. Quite a nice one because you only have to use the one triangle for 30 and 60, 
And if you can remember some of them, you actually can just get away with doing half of the triangle, which is what I'm going to do. And we've got 2, 1, and root 3. And again, we just need to read these values. So I'd be writing down Sokotoa again, just to make sure that you know which ones you're reading. Sokotoa, there we go. And let's just get these two values from the triangle. So tan 30 is opposite over adjacent. So we're looking at the 30. Opposite the 30 is 1, and adjacent is root 3. So tan 30 is 1 over root 3. There we go, and there's your first one. And the next one is sine 60. So moving on to the sine 60, looking at the 60 angle, opposite over hypotenuse. Opposite is root 3, hypotenuse is 2, so it's root 3 over 2. There we go, and it asks us to multiply these together. So what we've got to do is multiply them together and see what we get. So on the top, 1 times root 3 is root 3, and root 3 times 2 is 2 lots of root 3. So 2 root 3, there we go, and that is finding the exact value there. It does say though give your answer in its simplest form, and that's because of the top and bottom here divides by root 3. So we can divide the top by root 3, and we can divide the bottom root by root 3, and that will simplify the fraction, just like a normal fraction. So root 3 divided by root 3 is 1, and 2 root 3 divided by root 3 is 2. So our final answer there would be 1 half. Okay. There we go. So it's quite nice and quick to find them once you know those triangles. I think it's quite a nice visual way of, of, of um, actually just being able to find them quite quickly. Um, but you have got to actually know how to draw those triangles and understand where the, these values actually come from. Okay, so when we're looking at the area of a sector, and particularly when we're doing it in terms of pi, some of these questions can be easier, sometimes they can be slightly harder, but this one is sort of in the middle. So it says here that the diagram shows a sector of a circle radius seven. Work out the area of the sector and give your answer in terms of pi. So all we're gonna do is do the working out as we would when we were using a calculator, but we're just not gonna actually type it in. So to start with, we need to know our area formula. So the area of a circle is pi r squared. When we are looking at a sector, we also multiply it by the fraction that we're looking at, which I'll call theta over 360. So in this case, the angle is 40 degrees and the radius is 7. So if we plug that into our formula there, we have pi multiplied by 7 squared multiplied by 40 over 360. Now we obviously want to simplify this a little bit so we can, so we can get a bit of a simpler answer that we can give in terms of pi. The first thing that I'd probably simplify is the 7 squared. So that's going to be pi times 49, which you can write as 49 pi. And then we're going to multiply that by this fraction. I want to simplify that as well. So if I do that to the side, 40 over 360. For starters, you could divide them both by 10, which would give you 4 over 36. Then of course, both divide by 4, so that become 1 over 9. So we're going to times that by 1 over 9. Now, the easiest way to go about this is to just simplify those numbers. So 49 times a ninth just means 49 divided by 9. Now, that doesn't actually simplify. It doesn't divide perfectly. So that would just be the fraction 49 over 9. So I'd just say that this is 49 over 9 and put the pi symbol after it. And that would be my answer there in terms of pi. Of course, if they did divide, you could simplify that fraction further, giving it as a whole number. But of course, as it doesn't, and we're writing it in terms of pi, it's fine for us to leave it just as it is in a fraction. Look, we've got p as a point on AB, such that a to p, p to b is three to one. So obviously having a look at the diagram there, a to b, we're looking at that line. It says a to p and p to b is in the ratio three to one. Now, the best thing we can do is turn this into fractions. So if we think about that, that's a total of four parts. So that's three quarters and one quarter. So this part of the line here is three quarters of the line, and this part of the line here is one quarter of the line. And we always have to be able to try and move up and down part of this line, and we're gonna have a look at how to do that. So it says find the vector O to P in terms of A and B, and give your answer in its simplest form. Now this is quite a nice one. It's got, I'm starting you off hopefully quite relatively easy on this one, but A and B is already on the diagram there. Now if it wasn't, we'd have to, we'd probably be given these vectors, and we'd have to label them on ourselves, but this has been put on for us. So find O to P. So we're trying to find out how to get from O here up to P. And I normally like to draw a little line in for that, but I'm not going to do it for this one. Okay, I'm going to think, how do I get from O to P? Now, I can't move in this sort of direction, okay, at the moment. All I can do is I can move in terms of A and I can move in terms of B. So I can either go along the bottom here and then try and find a vector to move upwards this way. That's one option. Or, let's get rid of that, we could move up B this way and then try and go down 
to P this way. And it doesn't matter which one we choose, we've just got to think about how we're going to do that. Now in order to do that, I need to be able to move up and down the line AB. Now just personal preference here, I'm going to have a look at how can I move up from A to P. Okay, I could do it the other way around, but I'm just going to stick with doing it one way. Again, whichever way we choose to do it, um, that's fine. But I'm just going to have a look at this vector here from A to P. So I'm going to write that down over here, and that's the vector I'm going to try and find, A to P. Let's write it down here, A to P. That's going to allow me to move up and down part of that line. So, in order to get from A to P, the first vector that I'm going to have a look at is the full length of the line. How do I get from A all the way up to B? Okay, and if I can figure that out, then I just need to be able to do three quarters of that from A to P. And we can do that quite simply once we've worked it out, but I've got to find A to B first. So the first vector that I'm going to actually find is A to B. And when it comes to these vector questions, you're always looking at how you can move up and down the line without any vectors on. So that line A to B doesn't have any vectors on, and that's the line we're going to have to find. Now, in order to do that, I could, to get from A to B, I can go backwards this way. So the reverse of A, which would be minus A, so let's write that in, I'd do, I'd do minus A, that would move me back down A, and then I can go up through B, through positive B, so it would be minus A plus B. Okay. Now at this point it's completely up to you, but you can actually rewrite this in a different way, just to re remove having so many symbols, I can swap them over, I can have positive B minus A, and just have it as B minus A. Okay, and, and I do tend to swap them around quite often to avoid having the symbols, but they mean exactly the same thing. Minus A plus B is the same as B minus A. So there's that little vector that allows me to get from A to B, and that's an important one. Without that vector, we can't actually answer the rest of the question. So that's a very important one for us to look for, how to move up and down the unknown line. Now, I don't want to go from A to B. I want to go just part of the line, three quarters of the line from A to P. So what I can do is I can multiply this vector by three quarters, and I'm going to use that green one there that I've underlined, the B minus A. So to get from A to P, yes, yeah, so we go. To get from A to P, we need to do three quarters of that, so I can open it up in a bracket like this, just to make sure I times them both, and I get three quarters of B minus A. Now I am going to expand that bracket. I could, again, I could leave it like that, but it wants the vector O to P. So I want to be able to add some, bit, add some bits into this, but if we just expand that out, we get three quarters B, minus three quarters of A. And that allows me to get from A to P. Now that's a very important vector there. That now allows me to move part way up the line. Now obviously the question asks me to get from O to P. So we already know how to get from O to A. That's along here. So to get from O to A, let's just start to write this down. Um, let's have a think. So from O to P, let's just write it down in one step. We would have to do the vector. We'd have to go from O to A and then add to that this vector that we've got, A to P. And in total, that gets me from O to P. Now I'll just take note of this is that I could have gone from O to B as well, that gets me up towards P, but then if I wanted to get from O to B and I wanted to go up this direction, I would have had to have worked out the vector B to P in order to move down this way. Okay, so I chose not to do that at the start, I chose to work out the vector A to P that I've got in green pointing upwards there. So I can't move up this direction, but it's okay because we've already got A to P, so all we have to do is go along that A there. So to get from O to A, so I think about this, to get from O to A, it's the vector A. So if I write all this down, I'm going to get rid of this little bit in purple here so I can start writing it all down. To get from O to A, it's the vector A. I'm going to label this now O to P. That would equal A, which gets us from O to A. Add this vector from above here, which is A to P. Add 3 quarters B minus 3 quarters A. There we go. And if you have a look here, now we can actually join some of these up because we've got an A here, or 1A, and minus a 3 quarters A. Now, it does sometimes help with some of the harder questions to think of how many quarters that A is just to keep it all matched, and 1A is 4 quarters A. Okay, that might help to think about it, 4 quarters A, that's just the same as 1, 4 divided by 4 is 1. So 4 quarters take away 3 quarters would leave me with 1 quarter A. So let's have a look, let's simplify that, that's 1 quarter A. There we go. And then we've still got the 3 quarters B, that's remaining unchanged, so 3 quarters B. So we have a quarter A, add 3 quarters B. 
Now, a lot of the time, and this is a key little bit here with, um, with vectors, we normally have to factorize these vectors here. They're called resultant vectors. It's just the result of adding all these together. And normally we need to factorize this. And it's a massively key part of this topic. So I'm gonna just do this up here. I'm gonna write factorize. And it's very often, you can't factorize a whole number out, but you have to factorize a fraction out. And if you have a look, they both divide by a quarter. So if I wanted to factorize a quarter out, that would be one quarter. The one quarter A divides by a quarter once, so that'd be one A. And the three quarters B, three, a quarter fits into that three times, so it'd be A plus three B. And that would be our final answer there, one quarter uh, A plus three B, okay? Well, there we go, and that is our vector to get from O to P in its simplest form. Okay, so here is our next question. It says here is a scale drawing of a garden. It says we need to plant a tree five meters from point C, nearer to AB than AD, and less than three meters from DC. Shade the region where we can plant the tree. So this time we've got three things to be aware of, and also we are going to shade a region rather than a point. Now if you do want to draw this out and you want to replicate it in the same size, I could just measure this rectangle for you and as you can see it's 8.5 centimetres down and if we want to go across, the rectangle is going to be, let's have a look, around about 13 centimetres across. So again you don't have to draw this but if you did want to follow along by drawing it then you can absolutely do so. So we'll start with the first bit of information here where it says we need to plant a tree 5 metres from point C. So if we're going to go from point C, then again we're going to draw a circle around point C. But it does say it wants it to be 5 metres. So we need to have a look at our scale, and as you can see down the bottom it says the scale is 1 centimetre is equal to 1 metre. So for 5 metres, that is going to be 5 centimetres. So we just want to get our ruler and measure out our compass. So again, putting the compass point down at the bottom of the ruler and measuring out where 5 centimetres is. So 5 centimetres is only that far this time. So we'll put our compass point onto C and we'll draw a nice circular arc that shows where it has to go. So there we go, that is going to be five meters from point C. So there we go, that's our first part. It now tells us that it has to be nearer to AB than to AD. So A to B is the line that goes across the top of the rectangle from A to B, and A to D is the line that goes downwards from A obviously from A to D. So in order to do that, we need to do an angle bisector because we're gonna to wanna to find the points that are closer to AB than to AD. So we need to bisect the angle in half so that we can see all of those points on that half. Now obviously this is a rectangle and not a square, so you wouldn't want to just join the point A to C because that's not going to be a perfect angle bisector. So obviously watching the video on angle bisectors would be very helpful for this, but if you haven't watched the video on angle bisectors, I'll just explain it. So we go up to point A and we're going to put our compass on point A. And there are two ways to draw an angle bisector. I do it in one particular way, so I'm going to follow the process that I did on my video. So all we do is we take our compass and we're going to draw a nice arc that joins up the two lines. And we're going to draw a nice little arc like that. And then we just extend our compass slightly further and we're going to draw another arc and there we go. And that's all we need our compass for so we can put our compass out of the way now as that's enough for us to draw our angle bisector. So if we move this out of the way and we'll actually now join these up. So what we do at this point, so we do like what's called, well what I call a crisscross. So I take the lower point of the first arc and join it to the higher point of the second arc. And then again the other lower point on the first arc and join it to the other higher point on the second arc. And where those lines cross over that is going to be where our angle bisector needs to go from. So we go back to point A and we're going to bisect the angle and I'm going to extend that all the way to the end of the shape. And there we go, that has now split my rectangle into two halves in terms of closer to AB and, um, and closer to AD. Obviously we need to be closer to AB, so we're going to be above that line, obviously closer to the B point on the uh, top right of the rectangle. Now we've got one more bit of information that we need to do, and that says that it needs to be less than 3 metres from DC. So in order to get less than 3 centimetre or metres from DC, we actually want to measure 3 centimetres above um, the line DC. I've said three centimeters because three meters would be three centimeters according to our scale. 
So if we put the ruler down the bottom of this side to start with, you can see where three centimeters is. And we just need to mark that up. And we're just gonna put a little line here where three centimeters is. And then we're gonna do it on the other side. So going over to the other side, and again, just marking that three centimeters so that we know where three centimeters up is on both sides. Now you would want to take your ruler and join those up nice and carefully and we have a nice straight line. And again, mine's not gonna be absolutely perfect. I probably could have done that a little bit better. So I'd go again. Oh dear, that's definitely not better. There we go, that's looking perfect. So there we go, there is our line. And above that is going to be greater than three meters from DC and below that is going to be less than three meters from DC. So now we actually wanna go about shading this position on the map here or the scale drawing. So we need to plant it five meters from point C and we need it to be nearer to AB than AD and it has to be less than three meters from DC. So it has to be below that pink line and it has to be closer to AB than uh, AD. So if we think about where this is gonna be, we know that it can't be above the line, so it can't be here, it can't be over here, it can't be over here, but it has to be below that. Now we know that it also can't be closer to AD, so any of these regions here below the blue line, it can't be. Uh, it can't be this little one down here either. That only leaves us with two. So we need to plant a tree five meters from point C. So if it has to be five meters from point C for whatever reason, that it can't be close to point C, it will have to be this little region here just in the middle. Otherwise it would be closer than five meters from point C and it has to be at least five meters from point C. So that's the only region that it can be based on that bit of information and that would be the final answer to that question. But as you can see, a question like this is pretty difficult because you've got all these construction lines all over the place and you've got all these different bits of information. So you just need to go through them slowly and crossing off some of the regions can be quite helpful. So obviously we've picked the easiest one to start with was, which was the, that it had to be less than three meters from DC or below that pink line, which allowed us to cross off a lot of those regions. And then obviously the fact that it had to be closer to AB than AD allowed us to cross off the ones down the bottom below the blue line. And that only left us with two then. So we just had to think about that first piece of information, which said that we need to plant it five meters from point C which just meant that it had to be above or greater than that first uh, arc that we drew when we drew a circle around C. So there we go, that's that question. In a bag there are only red, blue and white counters and a counter is taken at random from the bag and the table shows the probability of each colour. Obviously though we can see we are missing a colour, we're missing the probability of white just here and we'll have a look at that in just a sec. It then says James is going to take a counter, replace it and take another and he does this 50 times, estimate how many times he'll take a white counter. Now obviously we don't know the probability of white but we can actually work that out. Now when I look at these probabilities in a table I like to think of these decimals here as percent percentages in disguise. So this one here, 0 0.5 is 50%. Uh, okay, and we can look at that as a percentage instead of a decimal. Blue we've got there is 0 0.3 and that's 33%, uh, sorry, 30%, there we go. And that is our second percentage. Now, all of these probabilities have to add up to 100%. So at the moment, we've got 50% and 30% and that adds up to a total of 80% at the moment. There we go. So we're missing 20%. So that missing 20% is our decimal for white, okay? And obviously we're writing this as decimals, so if we want to have a look at it in just in terms of the decimals, we could think of it as 0 0.5, add 0 0.3, that gives us 0 0.8. If we look at it in terms of the decimals, there we go. So to make that equal one, we are missing out on 0 0.2. So the probability of white is 0 0.2, or logically, if we think about it, that's 20%. Now the reason I think about it in terms of a percentage is that it's going to help us further down the line with some of these questions and it's going to help us with this second part of this question. So it says he takes a white counter 50 times. So if he takes a counter, the white counter 50 times, we would expect him to take a white 20% uh, of the time. Sorry, he doesn't take a white counter 50 times, but if he takes a counter 50 times, we would expect it to be white 20% of the time. So really all this question is asking us is to work out 20% of 50. Okay, so all we've got to do is pick out that little percentage question. So really we just need to find 20% of 50 and we can do that quite nice and easily. Always find 10% to start with, so 10% of 50 equals 5 and 20% is double that, so 20% is going to equal 
10 times. There we go, and there's our final answer, 10. Now, just another note on this. It does say uh, that word estimate. Now, normally the word estimate does mean to round, doesn't it? It means to round to one significant figure and make a little bit of a guesswork. Now, in this scenario here, the word estimate is just because we are using the probabilities in order to do so, okay? It's like when we flip a coin, it's a 50-50 chance that we'll get a head or a tail, but if we flip it twice, we're not necessarily going to actually get a head and a tail. We could get two tails, okay? So that, that's what the word estimate means in this scenario. It just means the fact that we are using the probability in order to make our best guess on how many uh, well, counters or whatever the question's about we're actually going to get. So there we go. That's this question uh, sorted. Find the missing decimal in the table. Obviously, you can think about that in terms of a percentage or in terms of a decimal. They've all got to add up to one or they've got to add up to 100%, depending on which way you want to look at it. And then you just need to have a look at the second part of the question. Have a think about what percentage of what it's actually asking. So in this circumstance here, it said 50 times uh, and for the amount of white counters, we identified that the white counters was 20% or 0 0.2 and therefore we could get uh, 20 percent of 50 there now if you have a calculator there is a nice quick way of doing this i don't think it necessarily helps for the progression of this topic but there is a quick way of doing this as well you could just do 50 uh, and multiply it by 0 0.2 and that just on your calculator basically is just a calculator way of saying work out 20 percent okay so it is the same process uh, but you'll get the same answer there so you can just do a little bit of a shortcut if you want to take a nice quick approach using a calculator but there we go that's the end of that one okay so something a little bit different here where we've got three circles uh, again so we've got all the same sorts of symbols but we've got a b and c to fill in here and again some probability questions but it says here the universal set here is the even numbers between 1 and 25 so if we write those down we've got 2 4 6 8 10 12, 14, it's a bit annoying having to write all of these down, but and it's better just to write down these numbers and do this little easy task here than to miss some out and get it wrong just because you couldn't be bothered to write them down. So it's definitely worth writing them down. Let's have a look then. So finding what's in um, different you know, multiple categories to start with, it's quite hard to spot, but I can see there there's an eight in all of them. So if we cross off the eight and we'll put eight in the middle and we go and cross it off from our main list. Let's have a look, are there any others that are in all of them? No. If we do find one that's in all of them, we can obviously go back and sort that out, but there's none, none others that I can see. So let's have a look in A and B. In A and B, there's a 16 in both. So there's a 16 in A and B. So let's cross that off in A and B is this one here. So 16, let's cross that off the main list. Having another look, there's nothing else that's in A and B. So let's have a look at B and C. Numbers that are in B and C, there's a four there. That's quite a nice one to see. So in B and C, that's this crossover here. So four in the crossover of B and C. Let's have a look if there are any others. 12, 20, 24, no. The only one last one we need to check is are there any that are in A and C? And there is, there's a 20. There you go, so there's 20 in A and C. So we can put that one in there, 20 in A and C. Right, okay, there we go. We just need to cross those numbers off the main list again, which I forgot to do. So cross off the 20, cross off the four, and that's all of them there. One, two, three, four numbers, and they're all crossed off. Okay, so left in A is two. So we've got two left in A. Let's cross that off. We've got six left in B and a 10, so 6 and 10, let's cross that off the main list, 6 and 10, and then 12 and 24 to go into C, 12 and 24, again cross those off, 12 and 24, and then we've just got a few numbers left to go around the outside, so we've got 14 up here in the main list, 18 and 22, so 14, 18 and 22 go on the outside box there. Right, that's all the numbers put in, so again we've got some probabilities, so it says find the probability it's in A and B. Okay, you can always write down the language there, A and B, that's the intersection of A and B. So what numbers that are in A and B, now this is going to be a little bit tricky here because A and B you might think is, let's have a look, this 16 here, but you've also got the 8. Now, yes it's in C, but it is actually in A and B, just because it's in C as well, doesn't mean it's not in A and B. So we've got two numbers there that are in A and B. So as a probability here, let's have a look, that's going to be two numbers out of, and again, just count how many are in that list at the top there. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So 2 out of 12. There you go. And you don't need to simplify these probabilities. It's fine to just to leave them there. Even though that simplifies, simplifies to 1 sixth, we can just leave that as it is. So the next one, we've got a U. We've got B, U, C. So let's have a look. That's B or C. There you go. So any number is there in B or C. And if we have a look, let's see what's in B or C. We've got all these numbers here that are in C and all these numbers here that are in B. So yes, some of them are in A, 
but they are the numbers that are in B or C. Okay, it doesn't say it can't be in A, but they are the numbers that are in B or C. So if we count those up, there's one, two, three, four, five in C, and then an additional one, two, three that are just in B there. So five plus three is eight. So we've got eight numbers. Let's have a look, here we go. Eight numbers, again out of 12, and again, it doesn't need to simplify. Okay, so just watch out for those when you've got your three Venn diagrams there. Just It doesn't say that it can't be in A. So those numbers that are in B or C are all those numbers within the B and the C circle. And then the final one here, we've got C dash. Okay, so there we go, not in C. There we are. And let's have a look what numbers are not in C. So we can't have any of these five numbers, basically. So numbers that are not in C, we've got the two, the 16, the six, the 10, None of those numbers left in the Venn diagram there because they're all in C. And then we've got the one, two, three numbers on the outside. So our probability there will be the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven numbers out of 12. There you go. So you just gotta be very, very careful with these. Okay, so this question here says, Mary has two bags of counters. In bag A, there are three red and two blue. And in bag B, there are four red and three blue. It says, Mary takes a ran at random a counter from bag A and notes its color. She then takes at random a counter from bag B. Work out the probability that Mary takes the same colored counters. Now again, this is an independent event because they're two different bags. It doesn't matter whether we take a red out of bag A, that's not gonna affect the probability in bag B because that's a completely separate bag. So again, we can construct a tree for this. Now it starts talking about bag A, so I'm gonna start with my tree being about bag A and I'm gonna label that up here, bag A. There we go. And again, it's red or blue. Now I've decided to stick with red and blue counters for all of these questions here, but there could be any, any sort of different combination of counters or pens or anything or marbles. It sometimes goes on about, we just need to make sure we read the story and construct our tree. So for red, there are three reds and there are two blues. So that's out of five in total. So for red, it's three out of five. And for blue, again, it's two out of five. Remembering obviously that those numerators have to add up to five in this scenario if you weren't given the information. So that's our, our pick out of bag A. And then we've got to have a look at bag B. So again, I'm gonna label the second branches of the tree over here, bag B. But again, we have two different scenarios. Now we could take a red, in which case we're looking at this part of the tree. And again, it's a red or a blue. And in that second piece of information there, let's highlight that there are four reds and three blues. So there'd be four, out of four plus three is seven, so four out of seven this time. And it'd be three out of seven for the blue. Of course, we could have taken out a blue out to start with. So we could be on this part of the journey. And again, there would be a red or a blue, but nothing's gonna change down there. It doesn't matter whether we take a red or a blue out. Red and blue are gonna stay the same. So it's still gonna be four out of seven and three out of seven. And there we go, that's our tree constructed. And again, just thinking about obviously the second little sets of branches there, both of the same top and bottom, as it's an independent event and it doesn't say anything changes. You know, it might say if so-and-so took a red in the in bag A, that the, the probability changes in bag B. If it, does, it doesn't state anything though, we always just assume that it's always gonna be the same there as, as it doesn't say anything's gonna change. So it says here, work out the probability that Mary takes the same colored counters. So again, just thinking about the logic here, like before, we had red, blue, and blue, red for different colored counters. This time it's the same colored counters. And there are two ways of doing that. We could get a red going through the three fifths there and another red going through the four sevenths. So that is our two fractions that we're gonna to have to multiply this time. So if we do those, we get three fifths multiplied by four sevenths. And again, times in the top gives us 12 and times in the bottom gives us 35. So there are 12 out of 35 ways of getting two reds. And then obviously thinking about the fact of the same colors, we could have two blues. So if I go through blue, two fifths, and through the other blue, three sevenths, that's gonna give us our second probability there using those two fractions. So if we write those down, we have two fifths multiplied by three sevenths, and that gives us six on the top and 35 on the bottom. So telling us there's six out of 35 potential ways of getting two blues. And again, finishing this question off, we've got two probabilities that we need to add together. So I'm just gonna write down the sum this time. We've got 12 out of 35, and we need to add to that the six over 35, and 12 plus six is 18, and that is out of 35. Again, remembering not to add the denominators together there. So 18 out of 35 is gonna be our final answer for this question.
as our probability of getting the same colours. Remembering again though, you could get a nice easy one. It could say what's the probability of two blues, in which case we'd have just gone along that purple route and got six out of 35. Okay, so just thinking about obviously the slightly harder style questions here rather than just one straight route. Okay, so if you're able to do these, you're able to do most of those questions there. Okay, so we've got a question involving some ratio. Now it says here there are 60 people in a choir, half of the people in the choir are women, the number of women in the choir is three times the number of men, the rest are children. It says the number of children to the number of men is n to 1, work out the value of n, and you must show how you get your answer. So if we start with that first line it says there are 60 people in the choir, half of those people are women. So for the women we know that that's going to be half of 60 and there will be 30 women. It then says in the next line the number of women in the choir is three times the number of men in the choir. So if we divide that by three, the number of men in the choir must be ten. And that means that the number of women is three times the number of men. It says the rest of the people in the choir are children. Well at the moment we've got 40 people, we've got 30 women and 10 men, so therefore there must be 20 children. And that gives us then a total of 60 as it says in the question. So it then gives us a ratio, the number of children to the number of men. So if we write our own ratio, the number of children to the number of men at the moment is 20 to 10. And we've just got those values just here, 20 and 10. Now that can be written in the form n to 1. Whenever you're writing in the form n to 1, you just look at this number on the right hand side and we'll just divide by that number. So in this case, that is 10. So that would become 1 and the 20 would become 2 and that would be our ratio 2 to 1 so the value of n would be equal to 2 and that would be our final answer for this question and just a little bit of simplification of ratio. We've got it takes 6 taps 12 hours to fill up a water tank how long would it take 8 taps to fill up the same water tank? Okay, so it's the same water tank, okay, but we're going to have obviously more taps here. More taps, again, thinking logically, it's going to take less time. So if six taps take 12 hours, how long would one tap take? And this is always the thing we need to work out. So if we actually work that out, we've got six times 12, okay, 12 times longer, and that's 72 hours. Okay, I think I might have said days there, but there we go, it's hours, so 72 hours. Now having a look, we've got eight taps, so it's going to be eight times faster, so 72 divided by eight leaves us with nine hours. Are you sure I don't write days there? There we go, nine hours. Okay, so it is faster. It's gone from 12 down to nine. Um, obviously with more taps there, it is gonna take less time. So always thinking logically about these, okay? Obviously, if you did take the wrong approach here, and please do avoid this, if you did 12 hours and divided it by six, that would give you two. And then two times eight would give you 16. And that is obviously a longer amount of time. Your answer doesn't make sense there. Because if you've got more taps, it's gonna be less time. And again, we are assuming here that all of the taps run at the same rate. And of course, if they don't, then it may take more, it may take less, okay? Because those extra two taps obviously could run at a faster rate and therefore it could take a lot less time, or again, they could be quite slow and actually it wouldn't reduce the time uh, that much at all, okay? But we are making the assumption here that they are they're all the same taps running at the same rate. Okay. okay, so on to our next question, and as I said, this is going to be a non-calculator version. Now, it is a little bit different. We've got direct proportion, and we've got some different formulas and numbers, but we're going to do this one without a calculator. So it says here, y is directly proportional to the cube root of x. So straight away, before we even read on, we can write y equals k lots of, and then the cube root of x. And then straight away, we can start reading our next line. So we've got when y is 1 and 1 sixth, uh, when x equals 8. So we can plug those numbers in. So, first things first, I would rather not put 1 and 1 sixth in, depend, especially considering that I'm not using a calculator. I would much rather turn that into an improper fraction and then obviously use that. So I'm going to write that as an improper fraction, which is easy enough. So 1 times 6 is 6, add the 1, which is 7 over 6. So I'll put that in place of y. So 7 over 6 is equal to k lots of the cube root of x, so the cube root of 8. Now we know that the cube root of 8 is 2, so let's write that over here, the cube root of 8 equals 2, and actually we can just get rid of that then and, write, and put 2 in its place. So let's get rid of that and put 2, k2. Now obviously when we're looking at using algebra, we prefer to put those numbers, or we're going to always put those numbers in front of the letter, so rather than writing k2, let's write 2k. Let's get rid of that again and put 2k, and there we go. So seven over six is equal to 2k. Okay, so as I said, the reason that we've written there 
um, of one and one sixth as an improper fraction is for this next step now. So what we're now able to do is apply normal fraction rules. So we've got to divide both sides by two to get our value of k. And because we've got seven over six there, we can just apply those normal fraction rules. So we need to do seven over six divided by two. And to keep it as a fraction, I'm going to write two as two over one. So there we go. And that's going to isolate k and mean we can find that value. And obviously just normal fraction rules here. So we'll flip over that two over one and make it one over two. So we've got seven over six times one over two, which equals seven times one on the top, which is seven and two times six, which is 12 on the bottom. So seven over 12 is equal to K. There we go. So our non-calculator methods here, obviously that'd be nice and easy if we had a calculator because we'd just type in seven over six divided by two. But there we go. Moving on to our next step then. Now we've got our value of k. We just need to put that back into our formula. So our formula is y equals k lots of, and now we know that k is 7 over 12. We can put that in. So y is 7 twelfths, and then the cube root of x. And there we go. There's the formula that we're going to use. Now it says here, find the value of y when x is 64. So this is actually a relatively nice one in the sense that we are not going to have to rearrange this because when we put that x equals 64 into this formula, it's going to straight away give us our answer. Again, we don't have a calculator, so we do need to do it without a calculator, but we're going to get our answer straight away. So we get y is equal to 7 over 12 multiplied by this cube root of x. So let's do this working out here, the cube root of 64, which hopefully you know is 4, 4 times 4 times 4. So we've got 7 over 12 times 4. And there we go. Again, we can just treat that like normal fractions. 4 could be written as 4 over 1. And if we times the top there, 7 times 4 is 28. And 1 times 12 is 12. So we get a final answer there of 28 over 12. Now, again, it is uh, a fraction there. We should be applying our best practice and simplifying that down. The top and bottom both divide by 4. So that'd be seven on the top and it'd be three on the bottom. So there we go. Obviously always applying that best practice of simplifying your fractions. So our answer there is seven over three, although we could be okay there writing out the answer as 28 over 12 as it hasn't asked for our final answer to be simplified. Again, we could even convert it into a mixed number. We could write it as two and one third, but there we go. There is our final answer, seven over three. Okay, so we're going to step it up a little bit now. We're going to look at sort of combining some of these together. So let's have a look at our next question. Okay, so on to our next question. Now you notice there's a bit of a jump up in difficulty in this one. And you might have already seen just by looking at those first few lines that we've got direct and inverse proportion in the same question. So it says here H is inversely proportional to P in our first line. And then in our second line here, it says P is then directly proportional to the square root of T. Now on the next line it says, given that h is 10 and t is 144, when p is 6, find a formula for h in terms of t. And we'll deal with that last line when we get there. Now if we see this, these words inversely proportional to and directly proportional to, we'll have to deal with those separately and find the equation or the formula that we're going to write for those two. So if we start going for it, we'll write our formula for h, which is inversely proportional to p. So look at that first one then. We're going to have h is equal to k over p. And again, we're going to find our value of k by picking out these values from down here. So it says h is 10 and p is 6. And there they are our two that we've got for, that are related to this first formula. So if we sub those values in, we've got h is 10. So 10 is equal to k over p, which is 6. And there we go. So if we times both sides by 6, and I'll write this working out in, so times by 6, and we get k is equal to 60. And then again, we can write our formula for that. So plug in that piece into our formula, and let's bring that down the bottom. We've now got that h is equal to 60 over p. And there's our first one dealt with. Now let's have a look at the next one. So we've got p is directly proportional to the square root of t. And this is direct proportion, so we'll write p is equal to k root t, our direct proportion formula. And again, let's find the values and put those in. So in this one here, we've got p and we've got t. So t is 144 when p equals six. So let's put those pieces in. So six equals k multiplied by the square root of t. 
Now again, let's write the working out down. The square root of 144 is 12. So we go k times 12 or 12k. So let's write that in the correct order. k equals 12, sorry, 6 equals 12k. There we go. Now, dividing both sides by 12. So here we go, let's divide both sides by 12. So we've got the value of 1k. Let's just write that in again. There we go. And we get k equals 6 over 12, which simplifies down to 1 half. There we go. Now, again, didn't mention this at the start, but this is a non-calculator question. So we do need to just think about simplifying that there without a calculator, which is easy enough to do. But there we go, let's plug that half into our formula. So we've got p equals 1 half root t. And there we go, there's our two formulas. Now, we can look at this last line. Now it says here, find a formula for h in terms of t, which means we want it to say h equals, and the only letter we're allowed it to, to be in that after the equals part is t's, and that would be in terms of t. So we've got our formula here, which is p equals half uh, root t. And p is also on the bottom of this little formula here. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna replace the p with what p is equal to, and p is equal to half root t. So let's put that in there, so we've got h, equals 60 over half, and just about put that in, root t. There we go. Now, technically, that is a formula for h in terms of t, although we are breaking some rules here. We're not allowed to have a fraction underneath or inside of another fraction. So we need to actually get rid of this half. So looking at what we've got here then, we've got 60 divided by a half. Okay, so if we do 60 divided by a half, that's going to be 120. A half goes into 1 twice, it goes into 60 120 times. So h is equal to 120 over the square root of t. And there we go, we're not breaking any rules there. We have not got a fraction inside our fraction. So that's perfect, there's our final answer. And we have a formula for h in terms of t. h is equal to 120 over root t. Right, okay, so cumulative frequency, that word in itself, cumulative frequency, uh, it just means when things keep accumulating up, okay, if you've ever played something like a board game and you've ever sort of uh, got a score within that game, the next time you get um, an another score on another round, you add that onto your previous score and it just keeps building up and building up until obviously you hit your sort of target or you get your or you get a, a win or a lose, okay, but that's what cumulative frequency is, it's just when something keeps accumulating and building up. So if we have a look at what we've got here, we've got a table that gives the ages of 60 teachers, and obviously on the left there we've got teachers aged between 20 and 30, there's 12 of them, all the way down to 60 to 70, and there are three of those, okay, so what we're going to have a look at is drawing this as a graph. So it's obviously draw a cumulative frequency graph here, and we're going to use it to estimate and find the median, or to find an estimate for the median. So in that first category there, from 20 to 30, we have got 12 teachers, okay. Now on the next category we've got 15, so in, to, in total, cumulatively up to the age of 40, if I add 15 to my 12, I get 27, so we've got 27 in total uh, by the end of that category. Then we've got another 18, so if we add 18 onto our 27, okay, making sure that you add that onto the number before there, and we'll see how many people we have up to the age of 50, that's where that category ends, and that gets us to 45. Then there's another 12, so add that 12 onto our 45 gets us to 57 people, and then adding our final three there gets us to 60, which means we've added them all up correctly because we know there should have been 60 as it said in the question. So that's our cumulative frequency, uh, and we just need to draw this as a graph. So just having a look at this, the ages start at 20 and they end at 70, and that's okay because look, our graph starts at 20, and it doesn't end at 70, but that's where we're gonna end over there at 70. So as it starts at 20, we'll start right down there at the sort of origin of the graph, and then we'll just build this all the way up to the age of 70. Now when it comes to cumulative frequency graphs, as we're including all of these people within that range there, we do plot it on what I call the endpoints of these inequalities here, so we're gonna plot it on those endpoints there. So that endpoint of the first category is 30, and the cumulative frequency up to that point is 12, so from 30 up to 12 is just there. The next one's 40, and that goes up to 27. So on the 40, all the way up to 27, I'm gonna draw it as best I can here, although I can't see it that well. There we go, just there. The next one's 18, 
uh, and that gets us up to 45 for our cumulative frequency. So we're going to plot that on 50 again on the end point. So 50 all the way up to 45 is here. Then we've got 60 that goes up to 57. And we've got 60 that goes up to, sorry, 70 that goes up to 60. There we go. So 70 that goes up to 60. All right, there we go. So uh, we just need to join this all together. Our cumulative frequency is drawn together with a nice smooth curve. So we're going to obviously start down at the origin there as it starts at 20 in age on the uh, on our little table. And we're just going to do a nice smooth curve going through all the points and kind of flicking off at the end there uh, just to finish that off. There we are. So a cumulative frequency graph will always go up and up and up. It might start sort of dying off towards the end there and sort of uh, uh, curving over a little bit, uh, but it's a nice smooth curve and obviously making sure you draw that with a pencil uh, and going through all those points nice and neatly. Now this particular question obviously asks us to have a look for the median, okay, so it says find an estimate for the median age. Now obviously it only says estimate because everyone's graph or everyone's curve could be slightly different, um, so it is only going to be an, uh, an estimate here as we are doing it from a graph. We're not actually lining these people up in a row and finding the middle person. Uh, obviously as these are groups here, they are a class intervals, uh, the median could be anywhere within that interval. We don't actually know, we're just using a graph. So that word estimate there, really important, okay, but we are going to use a graph to do so. Now the 60 people, um, so we are going to have a look where the middle person is. Now I know when we're normally finding the medium, we'll add one and halve it. And technically we could do that, but here we go. When we've got 30, we can just go along from 30 as it's only an estimate. And we can go along, have a look where that lies on the graph, which is around about there. And then using a ruler, going down nice and carefully, a straight line down the bottom there. And mine lands on what looks like 42. There we go. So I'm just going to say 42 there. Again, as best as I can, and that would be my answer. 42 would be my median, okay? So we always find the, the actual numerical person. So with 60 people, uh, we're going for the 30th person. So we found that on the left, and we're reading the age down from the bottom there, the median age, okay, on the 30th person. Okay, if you're still with me and you've made it to the end of that revision session, well done for sticking through. Hopefully throughout the course of that video, you picked up lots of useful tips and hints that's gonna help you in that exam. Obviously, there was a lot there, there was a lot to get through, so hopefully you are feeling a little bit more confident, ready for that exam tomorrow, and you've picked up a few little topics along the way that are, that's going to help you. Now, obviously, the exam's tomorrow, so let me know how you get on, drop me a comment, let me know how the exam goes, and I do genuinely wish you the best of luck in your exam. So please do leave me a comment and let me know how it goes, and we will get ready for preparing for paper two and three. But there we go, there was a lot there. Good luck in your exam, and I will see you for the next one.